Fam, what's going on? Good morning to you. Kyle Henderson, Bama Football on YouTube. Happy Thursday, April 4th. We are getting closer and closer to this Final Four matchup between Alabama and UConn. Let me know where you guys are watching from inside the comment box. We appreciate you guys being here. And to everybody inside the Undefeated, thank you very much for joining us this morning right here. Coming to you from beautiful Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Yeah, yesterday, uh, Smook and I went to practice, and uh, you can watch that video right here on Bama Football on YouTube. Ran into a lot of celebrities. Saw Kool-Aid there. Saw Roll Tide Willie. Uh, we're going to post a video from uh, <laughs> yesterday with Roll Tide Willie. Uh, it was cool. What's up, Paul? I see you coming in here from uh, Russellville, Alabama. Thank you very much for joining us. I know Chris is coming up to us from uh, New Jersey. Uh, Ryan, what's up, man? Good to see you from South Carolina. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, right here on Bama Football on YouTube. And to everybody inside the Undefeated, you got uh, the sponsors, of course, Residents Inn in Ocean City, Maryland. Promo code is LPR, 20% off. Sponsor is uh, also Rogue Shop. Promo code is Bama. And then sponsor, just like you, uh, Demetrius Maynard of the Maynard Group. So, yeah, there's a lot to dive into. I mean, you got the Final Four matchup coming up here on Saturday. I know you guys want to talk about that. By the way, the call in line is open all morning long, 205-850-1994. Uh, that is the call online line number. Uh, you have another Alabama uh, scrimmage coming up on the horizon, and that's going to be another great opportunity for us to uh, get a little bit more insight about where this team is uh, during this point in time going um, you know, into the spring season just a couple days ahead of A-Day. Remember, A-Day will be on Saturday, April 13th. I know Coach Sean is driving down from Huntsville. Smook and I will be on the scene. Um, and then we'll have coverage for you all day long on uh, Saturday, Saturday, April 13th. And, of course, the game is at uh, 3 p.m. on ESPN. So let me kind of walk you through the schedule in terms of football, what you can expect the next couple days. So there is another practice on April 5th, and that's the um, – offensive players and the assistants that'll be at 325 and then on saturday will be alabama's second scrimmage that'll be a week out from a day on april 6 and that'll be uh coach kaylin DeBoer uh at the podium um at bryant denny stadium and then you have next week you have a practice on tuesday a practice on thursday leading up to saturday uh the game um the crimson and white game good morning to everybody what's up loquacia good morning to you i appreciate you being here uh donald clark what's up man good morning to you countdown to a day how many do you think are going to be at uh a day maybe that could be the poll question for today do you think that Ale honestly so in the past i think for a day's overall attendance um you know it kind of fluctuates between i would say 60,000 and you know let's say 75,000 all right do you think there's going to be more than 70 more than 75,000 at a day marquita saying uh 100,000 you know what i am curious to see so the reason i ask this is because uh coach Sean, uh he hit me up recently because he's coming into town right and he was like i need uh information on hotels he was able to get a hotel really easy in town so um and, and that's for that Saturday. Like he booked at four different hotels and didn't have a problem getting, um, you know, attention. I don't know what it's going to be like. Um, I would imagine that, you know, considering the excitement level for this new coaching staff, that there's going to be more than 75,000. I think that's kind of the play too. why Alabama has been so adamant about getting coach Kalen aboard out in front of literally everybody because they want to showcase his personality. They want to showcase his staff. And, um, you know, A-Day is just around the corner and it's back on ESPN. That's That just kind of shows you, um, you know, the attention that people have on um, Alabama football. So I, I think everybody's going to say over 75,000. Give me a thumbs up if you think over 75,000. I mean, you guys are saying 100,000. That would be crazy. And Smook and I got to figure out where we're going to post up on campus, right? We're going to take our little two stools and, um, you know, we'll probably have, you know, uh, some bigger cameras there, I think. I don't know. We'll try to figure it out. But uh, Smook and I were on scene yesterday. And um, we had a really good opportunity to hear from the defensive coaches. So we heard from Coach Kane Womack. And then we heard from Deontay Lawson, um, Mo Linquist, And they had Tim Keenan out there, but they, we ran out of time in the back end. How this works is... There's probably like, I don't know, 
15 to 20 minutes to talk to these guys. And we kind of go from like the defensive coordinator and then kind of bounce around. Well, you see it right here when we streamed it live. I want to see this defense um, continue to improve. And I am curious if this defense can maintain that same level of uh, that Bama standard of defense because we got it last year, 100%. But this year, can they retain that? And, um, you know, K. Kate Womack, I mean, he, he's got a lot of fire in the belly. I love the clip yesterday that Alabama put out uh, with Roll Tide Willie, right? They're like, what do you want to do? Blitz, Bama, blitz. And look, this is a whole new regime. Everything, you know, I mean, they're welcoming all the celebrities. They're work- that I mean, they are um, full go. We saw, and we saw Roll Tide Willie. We're going to post a video about that. What's up, everybody? Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, I think we'll try to figure out as we get closer, maybe – um, here in the next couple of days, we'll try to plan like an actual meeting for all the undefeated. So let's think about that for sure. Did you guys see um, the plane from UConn? <laughs> they didn't. Well, they didn't have a plane to get to Phoenix. So there was like some sort of like mechanical issues or something like that. And then finally they tweeted out that they had a plane and they made it to uh, Phoenix. But it was hilarious. Like they could not find a plane. And uh, it was uh, everyone on social media was laughing. <laughs> the other thing that made me laugh, I don't know if, and I'm sure you guys caught this as well, but Alabama, pra- Alabama basketball, they practiced at Grand Canyon, like the, not the Grand Canyon, but Grand Canyon University, <laughs> the same team that they beat. Do you imagine like how, I mean, how you feeling if you're Grand Canyon and you're allowing Alabama to practice? I mean, that's cool. You know, that's, that's sportsmanship, but it's like, I thought that was hilarious that they had to practice at Grand Canyon um, ahead of this final four matchup with UConn. I love this matchup. I honestly do. I think that, you know, they play loose. Uh, you have nothing to lose. You have everything to gain. You can clearly play with UConn. No team at this point in time, I don't think, is undefeated or, or is uh, is undefeated, right? No team is undefeated. They have all lost. And no team is uh, unbeatable. Uh, is, gonna, is it going to be a challenge to be, you know, UConn and then Purdue? Hell yeah, it is. But that's how it is. If you want to be the man, you got to be the man, right? You got to be able to, to punch at this level. You got to be able to play at this level. You got to be able to play as a team at this level. Nate Oates, you got to be able to coach at this level. It's so amazing. You know what? Let me ask you undefeated. Do you feel that Nate Oates is going to win the Coach of the Year award? When is the Naismith award uh, announced? Did I miss that? Did they already announce that? If he doesn't win, he's got absolutely robbed. So that would be like worse than what they did, you know, year after year to Coach Saban and uh, to Will Riker. What's up, Bentley boy, man? I see you. When do they release that award? Can someone look it up real quick, undefeated? Because Nate Oates was 1 million percent the coach of the year. Think about this. He lost all of his assistants. That team that he lost last year, man, like that, that, that was the team. Sorry, allergies still acting up a little bit. I'm, I am taking the Claritin, I promise you. And I had to get the coffee in. Um, what's up? We got 100 on. If we could get 100 thumbs up, that'd be great. So, okay. This morning, I, my uh, my alarm goes off at 445. And I look to my alarm, and guess who texts me? It was Coach Smook. And he's like, oh, I'm ready to work out, man. I'm ready to get the workout in. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, uh, Northridge Middle School. I'll see you there. So Smook shows up. Smook, Smook went through the workout. And I'll, I will let you, um, I will let him tell you about his experience. Um, but he gutted it out. He did a great job. We are actually, uh, we paired up as partners. We did some cinder block work today. And um, he got it done. I was proud of him, you know, came, came with it. And I think, um, you know, that says a lot about you if you're that dedicated to get up and work out in the morning. I know we're always talking about the workouts and stuff like that. That's why it's important that you hit the rogue shop and you get some of that um, CBD for your back, right? Rub it on your back. <laughs> hey, Twelve, what's up? Coming with it, man. I got you. Yeah, Smook hit the cinder blocks, man. Yeah, we did it. Um, so he will uh, he will tell you more about that experience, and he will tell you uh, what he got named by the entire crew. We had thirty three out there this morning, which was dope. Um, it was, it was crazy. So on Tuesday, when I last worked out, so far I've done Tuesday and Thursday of this week, we did, uh, Tuesday, it was 71 degrees. And then this morning it was, what it was 40, 41 degrees. It's crazy. 
Uh, Moon Rocker, what's up, man? He's saying uh, CBD oil saved save me in my workout the other day. No, I feel you, man. Looking good, man. I like that uh, tank, man, with the Bama. That's what's up. Um, yeah, I only do like the topical, like the the oils and stuff like that. I don't, you know, I don't smoke anything. Um, that's just me. I just uh, that's I, I just use like the the lotion. Mine's kind of like a cream almost. You do you. I do me. <laughs> um, getting back. Uh, oh, we got. Uh, let's see. We got Chris from New Jersey. Let's take this call real quick. Hold on, Chris. And by the way, the call line is open all morning. 205-850-1994. That's the call line number. All right. All right. We got Chris from New Jersey coming with it, man. All right, Chris, what's up, man? I appreciate you calling in. Uh, thank you very much, man. And uh, welcome on in the show. Kyle, I'm only calling for one reason. One reason only. But you guys had uniforms on. They undefeated. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, Smook got his undefeated gear. And um, it's great. And we're we're going to, in our next series release for our shirts, the, the DEF is going to be in white. Um, so, it comes out like it pops a little bit more on the gray. Uh, but I had the, the white hoodie that I usually wear. And uh, yeah, I do I like to fold my arms like this, like Coach Saban. Um, and this cord right here, I've just literally like, I because I'd like the cord to go behind me, but I've just like, uh, it's it's all good. Um, but yeah, it was cool. So so Smook and I are there, and we're chopping it up, and you know we put we put our um, tripod up, and we're talking, we're doing our post practice report, and Smook's able to spot out uh, Roll Tide Willie. He goes over to Roll Tide Willie and Chad. And, um, you know, we, so then I that take the, ap- that was epic. Kyle. Yeah. So then I take the, the, our, uh, you know, our, you know, tripod over there and he gives us a little, uh, you know, uh, blitz bam of blitz and, uh, smooth got hyped and it was good, man. So if you guys haven't followed him, do it. it it's really been amazing to see. I, cause I'm not sure where he lives, um, in the state of Alabama, but he's like he gets the royal treatment. He like lives he w- under under the stadium, under the stadium. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's where he lives. Because <laughs> um, I mean, he's like the lead recruiter right now for Alabama, and he was fired up. He was even on the Alabama official account yesterday saying uh, he was like blitz, Bama blitz, uh, which I'm sure you guys saw, which was cool. <laughs> what else you got, Chris? Well, Kyle, I want to tell you the um, the uh, whatever you guys did with the with the microphones. That's the best audio mm. um, that there's in any and go, and go back and uh, you know watch that video. It's better than the audio on every video prior. So whatever you did, thumbs up on that one. Well, so the thing is uh, about the audio is so with Kane Womack, unless we get that microphone for him to like literally put the clip on his voice. So what you do with the microphone, right? Let's just say this is a microphone. You you want the microphone right here underneath right right under, right right here underneath your adam's apple right um so unless we can like clip it on him you know that would be like the audio that you hear right now but the way that they have it set up is that you can plug into like a box but the box sucks and it's low um or the other option is like smook is holding it you could see it kind of in the videos he's holding it towards like the subject um it, you can the, the proper way is to record it and then boost it in post production, but it, you know it, everybody's streaming. So by the time we would upload it properly, it's already kind of like outdated information. So um, we're just trying to you know do our best on the fly. But I appreciate that. Yeah, we have these like little uh, wind yeah. flags for the. It's been windy this spring here in Tuscaloosa, which is it, it's usually not too it windy. Worked. It worked. Kyle. Um, it worked. What's what's your thoughts on this uh, basketball game? You getting amped up to see Alabama play in Phoenix against UConn? Well, you know, now you guys, you know, you guys have stuck me with this, so they better win. No, I'm just kidding. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped to watch. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a, it's going to be a daunting task. Uh, somebody in the in the comments wrote, you know, you have to have, you know, uh, a lot of three pointers going, and mm. that's spot on. So, but you know, at this point, anybody could beat anybody. So, uh, you know, I just think we'll keep our, uh, 
we'll we'll keep we'll we'll keep our positive thoughts and prayers. And I mean, if, if going to the finals, I mean, I didn't think they were going to get this far. So I, yeah. everything is a bonus for me, Kyle. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. So uh, well, I appreciate you so, calling in, Chris, and uh, rapping with me this morning. Well, one last thing, Kyle. Yeah. I thought that that was the last thing. Was I thought the guy who taught you CPR? Oh I yeah, thought, I like that little. That was that was sweet little addition. I really like that. Yeah. But, um, um, listen, what, you know, hey, listen. The undefeated think you think you guys are all heroes. So that was great. Um, thanks for taking my call. Uh, I look forward to the game on Saturday. So roll tight, my friend. All right. Yeah, I appreciate you, man. Thank you, Chris. All right. So what Chris is talking about? So when we were leaving um, the practice facility, I ran into Edgar Calloway, who works for North Star EMS. He's like one of the head, um, you know, EM, EMS guys here in Tuscaloosa. Uh, and he's the one who taught me CPR because I took a CPR class with him. So we just were able to run into him. Um, hey, could someone post where those uh, final four shirts are for uh, Caleb? And I'll, I'll post the link for you guys, too. So if you guys want to buy them, um, I could post the link. We don't have any like in our gear store, but I'm sure there's plenty uh, for you guys to choose from. So just let us know. But we ran out. To, we ran into him as we were leaving uh, because he's always on site. Like he was, you know, driving the ambulance that day, and it was cool just to kind of rap with him and talk about chest compressions, only CPR. So um, I'm a really big advocate of CPR. My father was saved by CPR. I was able to administer CPR on somebody this year, which still blows my mind because I don't even know if I would have the courage to do it again. Honestly, I think I was just. I didn't even have time to really think. I just went into action. Um, but I've seen, I, I, and I actually talked to an EMT, um, who has done CPR 50 times and, uh, he's never brought anybody back, which is a scary thing. Um, so the, my point is the faster, the better, right? So immediately going to action and with chest compressions only, um, it's so effective. So anyways, that's kind of, that's why I'm a big proponent of it. And, um, you know, you'll hear me talk about that, you know, from time to time. I think when you look to, uh, this Alabama basketball game against UConn, I love the, and if you haven't watched, uh, Alabama's Twitter account, Luke Walters, uh, one of their players is interviewing different guys on the airplane of Southwest. And he even interviews Greg Byrne, the athletic director. Look, this, uh, oh, it's Fanatics that has the Final Four shirts. I'll put that up. Thanks, Sports Podcast. I appreciate it. Um, so definitely go to Fanatics to get your Final Four shirt. UConn, this team is built for greatness, 100%. I mean, who, who they, the, the seven foot four monster that they have, he's a lottery pick, 100%. Um, and you look to what they've done on the season, 35 and three. Um, I mean, they could be the first team since Florida in 2006, 2007 to go back to back. Uh, Tristan Newton's definitely a star. Um, Klingon is the uh, seven foot four monster. I mean, Purdue has their monster. So, I mean, if Alabama was able to beat UConn, they basically would have to be another type of a UConn in Purdue. Purdue and Alabama already played and Purdue took it to Alabama. Deontay, what's up, man? I appreciate it. Uh, with the run, the, the thumbs up. Uh, Marquita saying, uh, Bronny not coming to Bama. That would be amazing though, right? <laughs> Can you imagine those? Could you imagine those press conferences? My goodness. Um, in that courtside action, it would be uh, uh, King James, King Saban. <laughs> that would be crazy. Uh, hey, could everybody please welcome uh, the story of Doc? as a new member right here on Bama Football on YouTube. Hey, Story of Dog, what's up? We appreciate you, man. Nice avatar, Seven Dwarves. Uh, who can name the Seven Dwarves? Can you guys name them on the fly? <laughs> T, can you? T's just coming in. T, what's up? Hello, undefeated. There she is. There's the voice. You got your T? No T no for T. No T. Huh. She got her hair did yesterday. It's dead. It's like white now. <laughs> it's a little crazy. And the crazy thing was, so T goes to get her hair done. T, how long did it take you? I, when I when I say it took four hours, I, it literally took four hours. It was crazy. And is this a is this a normal thing for 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 no. for women? No, it is not. Um, but if you're going super light, like uh -huh. a lot lighter, yeah. it takes longer. Huh. So this is definitely the longest it ever took. 
man because uh she left and we kind of went over our, like our daily schedule like on the back end and we had a million things to do i even like like uh lacy had tutoring we had to reschedule the tutoring because the kids are off like thursday and friday um but when you know when you go to the see that's the thing look i go to uh rivera's barbershop in fact i need to cut um i like to keep my uh hair shorter on the sides but it takes a little bit of time but like usually i went like four hours my goodness um anyways back to this alabama um oh moon rock has got a happy sleepy obby dopey goofy and dummy <laughs> no. no those aren't the ones <laughs> um Doc and grumpy. hey t how many people do you think are going to show up on a day what was it last year um let's say it was like 70 yeah i'm gonna say i put the over under at seventy five thousand. yeah i'm gonna say more because i think you know it's a new coach people are interested to see like so you're gonna go more happening i'm I'm gonna go more man so oh oh, this is important so saturday if you're in the area if you're in the state if you know if you're a supporter of alabama basketball um you gotta go and uh you have an opportunity to go to coleman coliseum for free and to join the watch party they're going to have TVs, concession stands, giveaways, and that's going to be at Coleman Coliseum. Now, our boy Smook today, he's going to meet with the bar owners of Houndstooth to see if he can get us a booth at Houndstooth so we can like plug in our mics and like plug into the internet so we have a better connection from Houndstooth. Um, so I'll keep you posted on that. And, um, you know, we'll figure uh, Saturday night out on that because i mean this is this is monumental what is happening right now in tuscaloosa oh joe is like we spam uh caitlin's twitter for interview with kyle no don't <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's that's probably a good idea um i guess the uh i guess uh, the sid is mad at me from from alabama He's for, uh, for what disappointed yeah because we went into the, this whole podium thing that happened when we were testing the podium and he's like upset and um like for what you're not my boss like the guy like ripped me a new one and we apologized like that's the end of story there's nothing else to talk about it's, it's turned into this like crazy like huge adversarial thing when we're like the biggest supporters of the program right we like push all this you know press the, the yay alabama highlight the players you know we could go rogue when if they start losing games that would be terrible and you, you know this is the interesting thing are these same people going to oh uh Marquita, he said that he's disappointed in me for what what did i do nothing i didn't do anything um with these because this is the honeymoon period right so like are they still going to be giving all these interviews and the access you know if things fall off the rails a little bit i don't know i guess we'll have to see 8 49 eastern time is the game between alabama uh josh maxson that's that's the guy and the guy who yelled out like that's my podium <laughs> is uh christopher english you could look him up too he's that you know that I, I would never like to be that stressed in life um i um uh, the the people that i do like at uh, alabama aaron jordan he goes to the basketball game and uh same thing with steven gonzalez who does, who does basketball does an amazing job those people treat people with respect um they're really good to work with and uh really good people there for sure uh, greg Byrne is also amazing he'll like roll by the media and he'll be like um He'll be like, how is our esteemed media doing? How's everything going today? Oh, you got it's the esteemed media guy. Greg Byrne. Yeah. yeah, yeah and he'll yeah. come through. I and mean, um, yeah. he's no, honestly, he's a class act for yeah. sure. He treats people really well. He he just he he's and think about what he would he had the responsibility to okay, replace Avery Johnson. Okay. Whatever you're going to do, like you you had to do something because basketball was stuck in the mud. Mm hmm I think about how long basketball has been stuck in the mud for forever. Yeah, I mean, it's been irrelevant. Let me ask you this, undefeated. When was the last time like Alabama was relevant? Like they they've never been this relevant before, what, ever. The last time we made it to the um to the final eight was what? Elite eight. Ago? Yeah. Uh, the I final eight. I don't. I have no idea. Elite eight. Uh, that was way before I was here. I think someone said two thousand four. Two thousand four? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Two thousand four? Jeez. So twenty, literally twenty years. Yeah. Ago so yeah 2004 okay so where alabama basketball is right now like they are relevant we're talking about alabama basketball on april 4th we've never talked about alabama basketball really past like march early march so this is a huge weekend for alabama once again alabama has a scrimmage on saturday and then they have um 
you know, the basketball game in the evening time. So huge, huge. I mean, Alabama is the only team in the country that has been able to make it, uh, what, to, uh, you know, the playoffs and to the Final Four. Greg Byrne is, is doing his thing. And, and rightfully so. He just got a contract extension. 201, what's up? Hey, good morning. Thanks for joining Kyle Henderson. You're on the line. Who am I on the line with? And where, are you calling, uh, where are you calling in from? Hey, Kyle. It's Adam calling from Georgia. How are you? Adam, what's up, man? I appreciate you. Hey, thank you so much for the super chat yesterday uh, when Smook and I were on site at uh, the University of Alabama. I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I just had a couple of really quick questions. Um, first, what is your impression so far of Womack, and what's kind of like the vibe and the culture uh, in the building right now, and it, does it seem like it's different from Saban? Yeah, for right. sure. I mean, it's like it, it's completely um, – it's completely up tempo. Uh, all the coaches are, um, you know, they'll, they'll speak to you. Uh, people are like, you know, bright, cheery. There's a lot of energy. Um, kind of like let your hair down, um, but still uh, have that intensity. Like I, I think when the bullets start flying, they can get locked in. But I think under Saban, it was kind of like, um, you know, you kind of just had to walk like to the bathroom and like turn to the right. And like, you know, yeah. oh, like they were always like there was like it felt like there was like snipers everywhere. Um, you don't necessarily yeah. feel like that. Um, and I think like Coach Kalen DeBoer, the way he's been able to demonstrate his character, a lot of that stems from it. I mean, he seems like a really, really genuine person. Mm -hmm. Um, don't you think he seems like right. a yeah. really nice person? I like him. I yeah. Think he's and look, know. is there fire in the belly? A hundred percent. Right. Um, and you're going to see that when, um, you know, Georgia comes in, you see some of these bigger games, the first game of the season, the game going to Wisconsin, whatever it's going to be like. I think Womack is, um, he's a very talented younger coach who um, I see, like, I, I think in terms of speaking schematics, um, he gets it and he's ready. Mm -hmm. And the, the fact that, you know what I, what really stands out to me about the defense is Mo Linquist and Kane Womack. Like these were two head football coaches last year at Division One programs. And to have those guys here at the University of Alabama and to be able to hear um, you know, them talk about the defense and and the players and the schematics. And um, I mean it's really amazing. And they both have very high energy levels. They're not like monotone. Uh I, I can't even imagine Kevin Still in this type of environment last year. Kevin Still was uh, what almost like sixty seven. Yeah. And, and look, he did his thing, but um the way that it's designed now, there's a lot of energy. And, um, and, and of course, like I, I feel that the coaching staff is very good and this is the honeymoon period, but they still have to, and they can only do what they can right now. And that is recruit and develop the players. Right. Um, right. but the yeah. thing that makes people happy is winning actual games. And, um, that's going to be a challenge for every team this year in college football. Alabama's football schedule is, is daunting. Um, having Georgia as the yeah. first SEC game, going on the road to Wisconsin, these are not going to be easy games by any means. But they do have the players, and I do think that they still are going to the transfer portal um, and pull someone out on the defensive secondary. I think they pull someone in from the offensive line. I think there will be people that leave, but I think um, people clearly still want to be a part of Alabama. And I think when you look to recruiting and you look to what Ohio State has going on or LSU or USC, um, that's fine. It's early. It's April, and Alabama still has the magnitude and the megaphone um, of being on ESPN. Coach Kellen DeBoer is everywhere, um, so I think the brand is still going to speak for itself. And and I think that um, whatever role Coach Saban plays and all of this, um, you know, it, it's uh, it's good for college football. And I think that uh, Alabama is certainly in a really good spot. But it's all about develop developing the players right now. And in uh, recruiting, and they're doing that, and um, it's really good to see. But the overall energy, man, it's awesome to see, and it's awesome right. to to feel. And I'm really happy for um, you know the people that are a part of the program and that are here because um, you can feel it for sure, hundred percent. What else you got, Adam? Uh, no, that's all I got. Thanks a lot. I think we're going to have a great year, and uh, congratulations on the growth of the show. It's, it's well oh. deserved. Roll tide. Yeah, hold. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. Um, Adam calling in uh, right, from thanks. Georgia. Thank you so much, man. One of our uh, good supporters as well. You know, Adam's a under like he's kind of an underrated supporter of the show. He's been oh, yeah, he's he, been here forever. He's been here forever. He's been. I mean, when, back when we have like you know fifty people watching, whatever, he was always uh, you know super chatting, calling in, a big supporter of the show. So Adam calling in from Georgia, and and. 
I like his questions, kind of like right to the point. Yeah. And um, no, he's good, man. And Mark had I wanted to tell him hello as well. Yeah, Adam, we appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. Honestly, thank you. Um, Chris is saying Oats is rolling for sure. And the, the thing about Oats, too, is he hasn't changed. He didn't let uh, this success change him. Like, let me ask you this. Um, you know, besides like his flashy blazers, it, it, and I'm asking you this, too, undefeated. Don't you feel that I still feel that Nate Oates has like a blue collar approach. Am I wrong on that? No. He doesn't seem okay. like overly yeah. fancy or flan. He, now his jackets, his I jacket guess you could say like are, are fancy, yeah. but that's like game time Oates, mm -hmm. right? Like I think Oates is, you know, he doesn't seem like overly flamboyant outside of the Blazers. No. He doesn't seem like I he, so. I don't think he really bitches or moans about, like he's pretty, I, he speaks his mind. Um, he definitely does. He like he definitely needs like a throat lozenger. His <laughs> voice is gone. Yeah, I mean he yells the whole. It's like yeah, that's all he. Does. And I don't think know about how many games. Like think about if Saban had to play as many games as Oates does, he would have had no. He, he would sound the exact same. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Saban, did you see that video of um, him and Malachi Moore on the the golf course? Um, I, I think I recent, well, was that re, was it recent? I think it was recent. I just because I know it. they were at, um, where were they at? Cause I was at this event last year in Birmingham, um, old Overton. And that's where Malachi Moore, what happened? When he like missed the ball the first time and he yes. came to the swing. Yeah. That's that from a year ago. Yeah. That's from oh, a year okay. ago. Yeah. Um, but Saban likes that. He loves to, he loves to coach up his guys with it's golf. I mean, you've seen recently with his grandson. Did you see this one where he's like help, helping his, uh, Chris and Saban's, uh, son, uh, with batting practice. Oh no. Oh. oh, it's really cute. He's like, I don't know how old the kid is. He's like four or five. Yeah. And then you hear in the background, Miss Terry is like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh. I don't know if it was at the re was it the Regent Classic because I thought it was at Old Overton. That's when they had a. I think that's when it was. Um, Old Overton is one of these exclusive clubs that they have in Birmingham, um, and I think that's well, where it took. No, no, no. That, I think it was was Malachi Moore in a blue shirt. Yeah, they were both in like. Yeah, baby I can't even remember that. I can't believe I remember that they were in blue shirts. Well, because everyone was for some reason. I don't know. All right, uh, this one's coming from uh, from um, <laughs> behind bars. Okay. Collect call from Austin, Texas. Good morning, Kyle. <laughs> What's up, Mike? I appreciate you calling in. Get the free mic emojis going on. Uh, Mike from Austin joining us, man. Thank you very much for calling. Uh, welcome to the show. Kyle, thank you. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you for taking my call. You're the only person that does. So thank you very much for taking my call. I appreciate that. <laughs> But, but hey, man, you had a, yeah, there was a, a topic of conversation yesterday. One of them was, are we going to expect any more transfers after spring football when the portal opens back up? And, Kyle, here's my two cents on that. Yes, we're probably going yeah. to have some transfers. And, and y'all said between five to eight people. Mm. And I think that's a pretty accurate number. And the reason why is this, Kyle, now now that players know what they're getting into, they know what their in-team competition yeah. is. I mean, Austin Mack knows what he's up against. Ty Simpson knows what he's up against. He's running backs. No, all, all these defensive backs and wide receivers or whatever. Now they're starting to see their place on the team, or maybe they don't have a place on the team. So so I, I'm not going to be surprised if we had up to eight transfers after spring ball. I think huh. it's just normal part of the process. I hope not because we need stability, but yeah. I think in the football world we're in, we're probably going to get about eight transfers coming out. Yeah, I I, I think they'll definitely – I would say five guys leave. Um, whatever the case, five, eight. I, I'm not going to be shocked by – I don't think it's going to be like 15 or anything like that. I think this is just kind of the natural process of like the washing in and washing out. With that said, I think there's going to be guys that come in, and I think the transfers that come in, it's going to be the same type of approach that Saban had for the transfers. Like the transfers coming in aren't coming to be backups. The transfers coming in are going to be starters. Um, we've seen – in my opinion, I thought that Saban had a very high hit rate in terms of the guys that he brought in from the transfer portal that were effective. Um, and you know, we, we can't really, you know, say how Kalen DeBoer's transfers are going to perform because we haven't seen him play yet. But, uh, when you look at the early signs of the guys that have come in, like Keon Sab, and I know Damani Jackson is, is a saving guy. Um, you know, I think 
um, Keon Sab will be really good. And I think that uh, Jeremy Bernard, he could be a guy who's kind of an all-purpose wide receiver. Um, Parker Brelsford, you've seen what's happening with him. We've talked about that, you know, for the last, you know, five or six days whenever Tony Sukalis broke that news um, that he has been absent from practice. And it looks like the writing is on the wall for him to transfer, which I think is really um, some big news. I mean, he was the first transfer that came here to Alabama. And you know, it, Alabama, Washington is not Alabama. The Pac-12 is not the SEC. I have no idea what this kid is going to decide. Honestly, I would just say wait and and see how this plays out because where where things are in spring doesn't finalize you know anything for the actual season in my opinion. But if this isn't the place for you, I mean, have you ever T? Have you ever lived at some place where you're just unhappy, where you just things just? Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, look. I've done that too. And I'm sure you have as well, Mike. I mean, look, Mike's in a jail cell. Mike, are you happy there? No. <laughs> but, you know, uh, my point is um, sometimes that provides a growth opportunity, right? And you, if you can find the silver linings and you can work hard, you're only one play away from being the actual guy. What else you got, Mike? Well, you're right, Kyle. This place is not my happy place. <laughs> I can tell you that. No doubt about it. <laughs> but uh, here's why now. <laughs> you know, there's a there's a big basketball game coming up in the next few days. I believe Alabama's in the Final Four. I'm still trying to, like, come to reality with that. I mean, that's just that's an amazing accomplishment. So I just – it's they definitely got an uphill battle, man. Because I look at, like, UConn, they've just been crushing people for the most part, right? So and so Bama's got an uphill battle. But I'm not ruling Bama out. Mir Miracles happen. Bama can win the game, no doubt about it. But it's definitely, I think, it's going to take a near miracle for Bama to win the game. But it's a big basketball game. I'm just rooting for the good guys, Kyle. But also spring football right around the corner. So I can just tell Bama Nation, tell everybody, you know, hang in there. Kyle, I thought about you this morning, man. Kyle, uh, they let me out of here for about 20 minutes, and I ran down to the grocery store, right? And in the grocery store, they were selling this hemp oil in the grocery store, the CBD <laughs> oil. And I'm thinking, man, I'm glad Kyle's not here. He started rubbing that on himself, so I'm glad he's not here. He took out his rub on his back. <laughs> so just kidding, man, just kidding. That that gave us all a lot of comical, uh, comical seconds. So just, just kidding there, Kyle. Just, just be yourself, man. That's what we love about y'all guys. Just be yourself. But all right, man, roll tide, Bamination, stay strong. The future is bright. The dynasty continues. That is my, uh, that's my opinion. Kyle, take care, buddy. Good hey, luck. God bless. Mike, we appreciate you, man. Thanks so much. Um, so, T, I, I don't think you know, but this has become like a thing. Like with the, the CBD oil or the, the, the it's a topical oil, I like yeah. to rub it on my back or whatever. Oh, so yeah, that's, no, this I... has become like a thing inside, inside the undefeated. It's like I'm like <laughs> drenching myself in this. In the CBD. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. 100% th true. This is the true story. <laughs> that's how I'm able to uh, perform these uh, these workouts. Y'all go get some. No. Bama. No, but okay. So you also want to, um, along with the the this uh, these oil baths I'm taking, I'm also this is <laughs> this is the thing. I've also joined um, the like I'm gonna date myself now, but I'm trying to work on my. I, I'm honest. Okay, look, I'm a. I've been going to the stretch zone, um, so I'm working on my flexibility. And because I was like, I'm sick and tired of not being f flexible or having any, like, cause I, you know, I, I work out, but my hamstrings are super tight, my back, like, so I've been going to the stretch zone. He can almost touch his toes now. No, I'm serious. No, I'm, I'm the day that like, I'm, I'm making progress. Oh, oil, bath. <laughs> oil bath. So I'm, um, I'm working on my flexibility like all athletes do. Yeah. So, um, Thank you, Caleb. Yeah, yeah Caleb. flexibility is good for uh, golf. Yeah, so I go over. And so this is the funny thing. We'll have Ty Hayes joining us in second night. And we have uh, a 256 on it. So, so I'm stretching, right? And it's painful. They're like, they strap you down. Who's been to the stretch zone? Has anyone been in the stretch zone inside the comment box? So they, they put you down, like on this, you know, on like a, kind of like a massage board, uh -huh. right? And they put, um, they strap you down with Velcro and then they stretch you out. And it, it sounds like torture. It's pretty much torture. But the problem is I need, like, I'm trying to breathe it out. Cause I'm like, and as soon as they find out like what I do for a living, they just want to talk to <laughs> it, which is cool. But I'm like, and I'm, I'm a people pleaser. So I'm not like, I don't want to, you know, like hurt their feelings and be like, Hey, 
I really just need to breathe because I feel like my hamstring's about to pop. <laughs> so, uh, stretch zone, uh, I've been going there. Afron, what's up, man? I appreciate you, man. If they build a new arena um, next to the old one, still got to play games. So, I think where the, if they would build an arena, it would be down by where the softball complex is. Yeah. yeah In that parking lot yeah. where the RVs are. Yeah, there's a lot of space right there. Um, which would which would just pop. They didn't need to build. We should build a pop stroke. Yes. You we, should see this place. This place is insane. This place is insane. Genius. The pop stroke here, which is right next to Bomb Hours, if you've been here in Tuscaloosa, the Bomb Hours on uh, McFarland. It was. I'm telling you, how many people are on each hole? T. Um, twenty. <laughs> yeah. Not it's, an exaggeration. It's crazy. Um. So. Uh. Yeah. It's a. Uh, it's a wild deal. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, pop stroke is uh flying off, but yeah, I think I mean, the, can you? I mean, you know what would be crazy is if they beat UConn and they somehow find a way to beat Purdue. <laughs> no, no, it's gonna be hell to beat those teams I back. Know, to, like, uh, it's I gonna know. be crazy. People will storm the university for this new arena, they will start building oh, yeah. it themselves. They will. <laughs> um yeah can you imagine if we win and they still don't build it no they they will i yeah. think i mean they have to now i mean mm -hmm. sheesh final four you would think and nate oates i mean he's just uh man take some of that money away from the football team though you know i don't know if he said anything bad about um i don't know if he's commented on the new arena I don't remember I don't this year for that Auburn game, the lights didn't work or something like that. Yes. And Bruce Pearl was like, well, maybe they'll build a new arena. The Auburn coach. Yeah. <laughs> All right. At two, five, six. We got it coming in. <laughs> hey, what's up? You're on the line with Kyle Anderson. Who am I line with and where are you calling in from? Hey, good morning, Kyle. It's Greg from Athens. Greg, what's up, man? I appreciate you calling in, man. Um, you know, this game uh, is coming up. Everybody's talking about it. Final four Alabama practice. If you, in case you missed it, at Grand Canyon, the team that they beat during the tournament, UConn didn't have an airplane to get to Phoenix. Um, they finally took a train. Just kidding. No, they found they. It wasn't. It didn't. They they were on a plane and they had like uh, mechanical issues, uh -huh. and they made like this huge deal about it. And they were on social media, and they're like, "We don't have a plane." And the coach was like, "Nah." And then they got a plane. There's there's plenty of planes for all of us. Uh, <laughs> but there they made it. Greg, what's up, man? Thanks for joining the show. Hey, thanks, man. I'm uh, glad to be here with you. I'm sorry I couldn't call in the last couple of days. I work a crazy uh, schedule, but every time I'm off, I'm always glad to call in and talk basketball or football. I'm a great football fan as well and, and can help with that too. But basketball-wise, yeah, they need to quit. Our juju's already working. They can't even get their plane to work. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I noticed here, that too. What, that was hilarious. I mean, Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, come on, people. I know you got to have a backup. Everybody does. Um, I've just been watching a lot of content with different things, you know, analyzing this game. And, of course, we're like a 12-point, uh, you know, not, you know, we're 12-point dog. I get it. I mean, you look at all the stuff, all the stats. I mean, you look at everything. We, we should not win this game. But I've just got a sneaky feeling. I don't know why, but haven't you seen when everybody's just, so in love with the team, and like this other team doesn't have a chance. Somehow, the the, the underdog may pull off a win. And here's how we can do it. Um, luckily, we don't play best out of seven. We don't play best out of five. We just play one game. And all we got to do one game is be extremely hot. I think all the analysts are saying we need to hit 12 to 13 threes, which I agree, maybe even more. We've got to make their big boy have to come out and play. We've got to get him tired. And get him in uh, foul trouble. I watched the Creighton game. That's what everybody's talking about. I watched the whole Creighton game. They hit 17 threes on Wow. Yep. And it was a close game until about five or six minutes in the first half. And then Creighton hit about, just like we do, mm -hmm. may yep. hit four or five trips in a row, four or five scoring opportunities. They hit threes. And before you know it, they were down one. They're up 12. Mm -hmm. And UConn could never, um, they could never, they could never dig out of that hole. They went cold. They turned the ball over. They didn't play good. They didn't play good at all. So it's possible. Everybody, you know, and I know Connecticut, they've got four NBA players on their team. Yep. Four. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't even know if we've got – we don't have one this year. You know, it wouldn't be in the first round. It would be second round. So I'm just hoping they're overconfident and we come out and just play our thing. 
And uh, Creighton played fast that game, too. A lot like we do. It like watching little Alabama out there because they were knocking down threes, shooting it quick, and then getting in their grill. I think all we have to do is play little stretches of defense, maybe shut them down two or three minutes. Maybe we get hot, get us some full 6 0 runs, and add all those up, and we got a shot. Uh, Greg, I don't know if you saw this, but in Undefeated, did you guys see this? So Nick T- Nick Kelly of the Tuscaloosa News, they they had a basketball availability to go watch a basketball team, and it's a, just a short clip. It's just two minutes, and because the tempo of Alabama basketball is so fast, and he just shows two minutes of Alabama's bras- basketball practice, and it's basically three. It's it's just three guys running from one side in a full sprint, making a basket, and then three guys, basically like a three man weave, coming back the other side, and they go back and forth. Um, Greg, did you see that clip by chance? It had two million views or on Twitter. We've always talked about the Twitter views, but yeah. I mean, it got a lot yeah. of engagement. Did you see that? Yes, yes, I've seen it. In fact, when I coached, we ran the same drill because when when Nate was at Buffalo and yep. stuff, I watched a lot of his videos, a lot of their practice things. I mean, you t- yeah, you can get in shape quick. Um, and it's not what you know, you're not running sprints that just to me is useless. You need to run and you know, you're handling the ball, you're making decisions, you're attacking the rim, you're either shooting a three or whatever you're doing, and you're back and forth, back and forth. And that's all you really need to do to stay in shape. But yeah, I've watched it, and it's so weird. This is the first Final Four I haven't been to since COVID. I oh, went wow. seven or eight years. Wow. Me, me and my son, Todd, you know, my son's name is Todd. I think you remember he's a college coach, so we get tickets. But this is the first year we can't go, and I'm so ticked because we're not going. Of course, it'd be the one year we didn't order tickets in advance that, you know, the way we were playing, I thought, well, it's just a waste of cash. So I thought this year, because it's in Phoenix, we live in Alabama. Eh. Next year, I think it's in San Antonio, which is a great place to go watch a game. Yep, yep. We'll go, for, but, you know, I'm. That's just my luck. It's bad. <laughs> well, you know what? I mean, think about this. I, and I was talking about this yesterday. So the these games are at the State Farm Stadium in Glendale, right? The home of where the Arizona Cardinal yep. plays. So it's a football stadium. Um, it's a gigantic stadium. Uh, but I, I'm yep. curious from a, like a basketball perspective. Like, I mean, A, of course, this is going to be a, a sellout. Mm-hmm. But do I, I mean, there's... They always say there's never a bad seat in the house, but I think in this particular game there might be. I mean, it's a huge stadium for a basketball venue. I don't, I don't know, um, but I'm with you. I mean, San Antonio, and I, I, I think it's a matter of time until probably San Antonio maybe gets like an NFL team. I know they've talked about that before, but I think I mean with the population of what like two million. Um, I mean, you see with the the love yeah. that they have for the Spurs. Um, you know, I don't know. Anyway, San Antonio is kind of a underrated little city that people don't know about. Um, anything else, oh, Greg? Great. Yeah. I love San Antonio. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, yeah. I was just going to say, if nobody's ever been, if anybody's ever been to Final Four, of course, they always play in football uh, stadiums. Honestly, I watch the big board more than you do um, the actual court because it's just, it, it, I mean, it's really not unless you're really, really close. It's not a great seat, but I mean, it's just the atmosphere. Yeah. I've been to Indianapolis. I've been to Minnesota. I've been to Minneapolis. Been to Indianapolis. I've been um, San Antonio. I've been to Houston last year, and Houston was huge. I, I didn't really enjoy the city that much, yeah. but uh, that place was really big. But um, yeah, I've been to several of them. It's fun. That's awesome. I love it, and I really love going. To the, the, the coaching clinics are great when you go to those and get to see, you know, coaches and stuff. So, yeah. But anyway, I'm just hoping we, uh, all we got to do is play one good game and play a little bit bad. And heck, we're in the championship. Yep. Man, that'd be crazy. I appreciate you calling in, Greg, and uh, probably catch up with you one or two more times before this tournament game, anyways, man. So definitely call back. Yep. I'll call tomorrow. All right, man. Take it easy. All right. Uh, Greg calling in uh, from Wait Athens. We got, um, uh, our boy Ty Hayes uh, come uh, right now. Ty, what's up, man? I appreciate you being. Sorry, I'm late. I uh, I thought I'd have time. I, I allocated what I thought was enough time for breakfast this morning, but what I never can take into account is Denton traffic, which sometimes it'll take you 30 minutes to go one and a half miles. Huh? Yeah. I mean, look, there's the the traffic here in Tuscaloosa. It's the the city was designed. How, who who's been to Innisfree in this uh, comment box? I think that whoever di- designed the city <laughs> went to Innisfree, partied as hard as they could, 
and then brought out a, a napkin, a napkin yeah. and said, let's design this city. And they were drunk and they just put it together. Uh, T? I 100% agree. This is the only reasonable explanation. It's really hard to turn into different businesses. Like when you're going, if you get on McFarland and you're going by the mall uh -huh. and you have to get like to the other side, <laughs> it's like the, the city. And so what I think they've tried to realize this, like, and if you go to Northport, how about the bumper things they're putting out? Like the little like concrete, like, like <laughs> well, there's this, now there's this construction going on from one. So McFarland is like our, our main, that's like our main artery. And it goes every direction, goes east, west, yeah. north, south. Yeah, it's everywhere. It so on this one stretch in Northport, it goes as the, the construction goes as far as the eye can see on both sides. And in one area, there's this one lane and it looks like they've, they're building a, a metro or something, but they're not. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but they're, is it, yeah, it are they building like a subway like here? A, like a train. Like, yeah, I don't. It, I mean, it, it's just another lane, I think. Yeah. But, but right <laughs> by there, there's that cut through road. And I guess people were going too fast down it. So they <laughs> they just put these like yeah. concrete, um, like the things at the end of parking spots, right? Mm. But it's just like, all, like randomly placed. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, it's like something that you'd, it you'd no warning. It's like something that. that would be like on Mario Kart. Yeah, the, like a, yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> so anyways, everyone has their issues. We have ours here in uh, Tuscaloosa. Ty, um, Final Four, a couple more days away. So what, what's your take on this uh, game being at uh, in, in Glendale? I'm, I'm looking, the stadiums, you know, it's a, it's a great setup for a football game, but for a basketball game, are we mad about this? Uh, to be honest, I don't really know enough right. about basketball venues to, to know. Um, I've watched... However many, like, I've watched a few March Madness games, mainly all the Alabama ones, but that's about all the college basketball I've I've watched this year. That's that's the extent of my college basketball is whenever March Madness happens, that's when I start watching. Until then, I, and the same with the NBA, I don't I don't even know who will make the playoffs, and then when it gets to playoffs, that's where I show up. What is happening? <laughs> Look at, I, I almost went into the undefeated box. <laughs> I'm trying to, to size up my camera to where I'm like a little bit like lower. Um, but but <laughs> well, it, it also doesn't help that my hydraulics on the chair decided to uh, launch a coup against me yesterday. So I did a video um, and at the start of the video, I'm sitting nice and tall. And by the end of it, I'm like all the way down here. So I, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, I was trying to get like set up. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, is that good? <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh man, I almost went into Ty's office. I know, I was like... <laughs> oh god, it's so funny. Um, yesterday, uh, Alabama held another another practice, and on Saturday they're holding their scrimmage. Uh, what are some continuing things that we're looking for, Ty, with this team? We talked about the transfer portal. Um, you know, honestly, it's it's a uh, and yesterday, uh, Coach Walmack talked about um, Quay Russo and said that Yonze Pierre is just like, uh, you know, basically like a freak. I mean, and I can't wait to see him be able to uh, contribute in some fashion because he's been one of those guys. We're like, we can't wait to see him. And there's been a lot of buzz about Tony Mitchell. Like people are like, where is he? What's he doing? Um he talked about him a little bit yesterday and said that he's still kind of, you know, like everybody, still getting new to this playbook, whatever it is. Um, what are some continuing themes that we're looking for or, yeah. or that you're looking for? Well, it, speaking on Tony Mitchell, and I, I have no insight here, but if I'm not mistaken, he was dealing with a hamstring injury. And for everybody in the undefeated, I'm sure I don't have to tell most people this, those hamstring injuries oh. can be awful to recover from. Like, genuinely it seems like it's a it's a non-issue right it's like oh he he's got a hamstring issue let him mm. rest get right it'll be all good mm. more often than not at least for the guys that i've known right I, a very good friend of mine played college football had a hamstring injury that lasted his entire senior year and followed him to the nfl and he got it right but like those hamstrings, man, they can set you back a, a bit yeah. in your recovery because it's it's almost like when Malachi Moore injured his back. Those back injuries, those it's really easy to re-aggravate it, and then mm -hmm. you're kind of right back at, at step one. Um, so I, I think Tony Mitchell would be just fine. It's just a matter of health. It's just a matter of experience. 
Mm. I loved hearing about the young defensive backs not looking like young defensive backs. And Kyle, you already said it. I have been sitting here for the past few days talking about these pass rushers, what it could look like. And a name that I keep talking about is Yonze Pierre. Because yeah. when I look at this defense and I look at his skill set, yep. I don't know that he will be the full-time guy off the rip when you have Keanu Cott, who's looking good, Quindarius Robinson, who's looking good, Quay Rousseau got a shout-out yesterday. But Pierre is a pure pass rush specialist. Mm. He's going to be tough to keep off the field. Yeah, I um, I look to and, – and that's kind of something that I'm looking forward to too is like who is going to get after the quarterback – uh, this year, following you know what Alabama had in this past season, um, in the in the season before that, I mean, think about uh, who Alabama is really replacing over the last two seasons. I mean, William Anderson and Dallas Turner, Chris Braz. I mean, th those are some players that are absolutely elite, right? I mean, some of the best that there's been in college football um, over the last several years. I mean, William Anderson. I mean, winning the what did he win the defensive rookie of the year? Um, yeah. I mean, he was is crazy. Um, and I think going back to what you said about the hamstring, I think you're right. I mean, you know, it's uh, those are nagging issues. And because I have seen him at practice and he did have a what, what they do. It's amazing. So they actually build you. It's kind of like a hamstring apparatus to where they can build you a hamstring based off this design mechanism. Jeff Allen does it. It's crazy where um, it goes down to your calf to your hamstring. And it basically allows you to still have that similar movement. It is crazy. That would be like having to look this up. Look up a uh, a hamstring apparatus, and you will be like they've done this before. They've been doing this for the last couple of years, and it, it kind of looks like a almost like a um, kind of like a um, like a like a piece of uh, like metal or whatever the fabric is behind the hamstring, going all the way down to the calf. You could see it on Tony Mitchell. I don't know what it is, uh, but they have that. That's the type of stuff we're always talking about, like, you know, the next level type stuff that Alabama has, you know, within their sports and science center when they're cooking up things. Um, Ty, what questions do you have for me, man? I'm here, you know, boots on the ground. I've uh, been watching the team, you know. Uh, I mean, has there been uh, over the last, you know, I don't know, like week or, you know, 10 days? Is there anything that you've been kind of curious about that maybe I can answer for you? Right tackle, right? Because mm -hmm. left tackle Though I have questions, at least there's a perspective answer in terms of Caden mm -hmm. Proctor, who will be yeah. battling for that mm -hmm. position. Remember, nothing is given. Everything is yeah. earned. But yeah. right tackle, what are we looking at there? What can we expect there? I'm not worried about guard. Alabama, I think, will yeah. have the best guard duo in the nation. But right tackle, mm -hmm. what are we looking at? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, a guy like Wilkham Formby, um, which would be really cool, could certainly make a huge push this spring and, and already is. Um, I don't know if anything I, – I don't think that we leave a day knowing who the right tackle is going to be. I think it's still open for a transfer to come in, whether, um, you know, and we don't know who that's going to be. I think, uh, you know, whether that's Nyquil Bentrade, Will Conformby, um, you know, uh, McVay, like the, a lot of these guys um, have to battle for that spot. I think it's open competition up into the first game you know, of the season. Uh, and, and kind of depending on what happens with this whole uh, Kane and Proctor thing, too, right? Like he has to officially come back, this and that. And where is Pritchett going to be? I, I mean, that, that is an amazing question, and I don't think that is going to be answered. I don't think the center position is going to be answered. So really, I think Alabama has, um, you know, the two guards, and we know that for sure. And I think they are going to be elite guards. I think they are going to be the best guards. Probably, that's probably the best guard tandem that you have in the country, right? I think um, with Jaden Roberts and Tyler Booker coming back. I mean, Tyler Booker was all SEC. Jaden Roberts turned out to be one of the best Alabama offensive linemen by the seasons. And um, James Brockermeyer, is he going to be that guy? I don't know. I mean, it kind of looks like it right now if they were to have a game this weekend. Um, but I don't know, um, you know, who's going to be that right tackle. So I think even whoever starts uh, during A-Day in this little crimson and white deal, um, I don't know, you know, if that's going to really solidify, you know, the spot for the season. I'm also curious, too, because Coach Saban had this going on. You played for um, steak or beanie weenies. Yeah. So, like, the winning team got... For? Yeah, so this, the winning team got steak and the losing team got beanie weenies. Interesting. So, is that a Saban thing or is that a Coach Kelly? You know, what, what will he do? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm curious to see if they have that. They got to keep that. Yeah. I don't know. Who knows? What else you got, yeah, Tom? You would think they would keep that. 
So it's right tackle, that, that's a big one. I guess my other question, whenever we're talking interior defensive line, I think we have got so much talent there. But Kyle, how are these young guys progressing? And not only just on the interior, but like a Jordan Renaud, an Edric Hill, yeah. a, a Payne, a James Smith. What's mm. the feeling around that group right there? Yeah, I mean, James Smith is going to be a guy like he already is a guy that people are, you know, super amped up about. And I think um, some of these younger guys, what's amazing about this particular year with some of these younger guys is they're up in like the front of the reps. They're they're the guys that are already playing because of some of the depth that left before, like specifically. And, and everybody knows it's like the secondary. I mean, we we're talking about this yesterday uh, before um, Womack hit the podium is that Red Morgan is repping with the ones. Uh, which is amazing. Zay, Zay Mincy, you know, he's getting, um, you know, opportunities as well. And I think these guys would get opportunities regardless, um, you know, of whichever season. But I think what amplified their playing time and their ability to get onto the field was the fact that so many people left. So now these freshmen are just right there in the fold. I don't know if these guys are going to start, but I know this for sure. They're going to be so ahead of the curve come the first game of the season because as we spoke about plenty of times, some of these guys got here, which is crazy, got here in December and we're a part of the Rose Bowl. Think about that under a different coaching staff. And then they came in fresh. So like a new coaching staff, all that stuff. And they stayed here and now we're already in April. So they've been here December January, February, fourth quarter program, March. They've already been here five months. It's not half a year. That's right? crazy. I mean, Time about, gone right? by. And some of these guys are is supposed to be in high school still. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And they're playing in the Rose Bowl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're playing in the Rose Bowl or you know, practicing the Rose Bowl, and they're here at practice, which is crazy. Um, let's see, Jay Towns and Kyle. We used to have steak and beans and weenies when I sold cars at the Mercedes and yeah. Look, that, you know what I – has anybody gone like the – if you go to your local gas station, those little beanie weenies, you had those and you pop them open? Yes, I think you got a can. Like, Remember, yeah. I got a can and I came home and I popped it open. You you were loving it. I thought it was good. I They're left, really like, good. I grew up on that kind of stuff. Though. Hell yeah. Well, I, I have one. Uh, and Jay, he's just giving me inspiration. How about the winners get Mercedes NIL deals and the losers <laughs> get Buick NIL deals? <laughs> hey, Buicks are nice. Hell yeah. That Buick <laughs> that we saw recently was really well, nice. Yeah, yeah. Listen, listen. We can we can throw them yeah. some older Buick. Buicks, right? That way, that way there is like a delineation between the two. But just something to think about, right? Let's up the stakes on this, right? Let's... Let's get some real stakes yeah. going. Does anybody have a Buick inside the undefeated? Yeah, because there was one um, at Kyle's neighbor's house the other day, and I was like, what is that? That car is amazing. They're nice. And yeah. It's a Buick. Uh -huh. It's like those new Genesis. I think um, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, yep. Those new Genesis, the Hyundai, and then they they kind of separated from Hyundai where they're still Hyundai, but it's yeah. like their luxury line is the Genesis line. And, I mean, you see one of those rolling down the road. You do a double take, and you're like, there's no way. Yeah, That's and yeah, it is. Yeah, some of those. I mean, I don't know. All I know is uh, that's not a bad idea because the Utah football team they all got um, Dodge Rams. Did you see that? Yeah, I did see that. You saw that, right? I did not Ty? see that. No. Yeah, last year the entire football team, everybody on the roster, went out and they all got a brand new Dodge fifteen hundred. You said this was Utah. Yep. Look it so up. Do I do I need to convert to Mormonism to join the team, or what's the, what's the stipulations <laughs> look, there? You, look, Utah has always had that. They, they've punched above their weight. They've always had a salt defense for sure, right? Well, I love Kyle Whittingham. Oh, of course. I, I think he's yeah. one of the most underrated coaches in all of the game. Yeah. That guy continuously is a thorn in the side of <sighs> Utah. Is one of those teams where, like, yeah, even if you should win, they're not going to make it easy on you. Mm -mm. They are going always to going make... to beat somebody. Yeah, they're yeah. good. Uh, that's that's I, I you know it's funny because Kyle Jance and I for two years now it's kind of funny how it went full circle. But Jance and I for two years would scream on Monday nights on my live stream, <laughs> watch Washington, watch Utah. Like mm. yes, the pack top to bottom yeah. isn't there, but man, there are some coaches in the pack. There are some things out there that you have to watch. And we were screaming like Kyle Whittingham, maybe the most underrated coach yeah. in all of college football. And we kept saying, Kalen DeBoer and Michael Penix are doing something special. Watch out for it. Yeah. And it's just awesome now that Kalen DeBoer ends up at Tuscaloosa, right? Um, 
And it, you know, Merrill does shout out to our guy, Merrill. He always made these great points about how coach Kalen DeBoer has just been in a position where he has always followed up great coaches. Mm -hmm. And that's why one of the reasons it makes sense that he would be the one to want to follow Saban. I mean, the guy he followed at Sioux fall was like the Nick Saban of NAIA. Yeah. And then he's not far off from Chris <laughs> Peterson at Washington and Peterson at Washington yeah. was phenomenal. This guy has only known high stakes, high pressure takeovers, and he's done nothing but excel and exceed expectations. Winners win. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I've really enjoyed uh, these interviews and uh, just getting to understand like his demeanor and thought process. He's great, man. He's been really, really good from what he's been able to do. He's been balancing a lot. I can't even imagine, you know, taking over for Coach Saban and having to deal with all this, but it's been really cool to see him. We actually, inside the comment box, people are people don't like mayonnaise, mayo. I'm seeing that, yeah. Yeah, they're not. Uh, My grandfather used to eat mayonnaise sandwiches. They're talking Ty, are we a fan of uh, mayo? I, I don't dislike mayonnaise, but like it's I, I don't like a lot of it. Right. Like if I'm going to have a sandwich and it has some mayonnaise on it, that's fine. Um, but it better be Duke's first and foremost. Oh, wow. Like a certain... Duke's, Duke's mayo is the best. Huh? If it's not Duke's. I don't want it. And even if it is Duke's, like just a very small amount, just enough to where it's, the sandwich isn't dry. But like I prefer <laughs> mustard. Or or other condiments to mayonnaise. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Goopball is saying my grandma used to make mayo, pineapple, and cheese sandwiches. Ugh. You know what? People's palates though have changed. You know, you know my grandma, you know what she calls a mayo? Salad dressing. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's boy. like she's like, where's the salad dressing? It's mayo. It's like <sighs> stop it. They call her Nana. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's unfortunate. Uh, let's see. Hold on. We have a uh, Bama fan ninety five. What's up, Kyle? Do you know anything about the YouTube restarting lives? Back to the beginning without playing the ad and allowing to skip. Do we know any of that? No idea. Uh. -uh. I'm not sure on that. Um. Usually, how it works, like if I was watching a live, you probably have to watch like an ad or two, and then the the show starts where it's you know kind of in progress. So if you just join right now, you're gonna start where you're where Ty and are. But you can rewind, I think, when the show – you can, of course, when the show's over, you can rewatch it. But I, I'm not sure. Um, so sorry about that. I mean, hopefully you're having – you're not having the uh, terrible experience. But thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Sorry I can't um, answer more. Um, fam, please support Ty. Um, his uh, solo segment starts right now. Treat him like you would treat me. Um and thank you so much for supporting us. And remember, you got Coach Smook uh, joining Ty um, here at uh, 1030. And he can tell you about his experience of going to F3. When we do our morning workouts, it feels like right now is like the afternoon. Um, he did a really great job. We did bear crawls. We did some cinder block work. We, um, I don't know, got in a couple miles. It was pretty intense. My heart was pumping for sure. So uh, it was a really good workout. Smook, um, you know, came with it this morning. And, uh, you know, here we are. So I appreciate you guys joining me for my segment, Ty. I'll be back. As, as news happens, news breaks, boom, I got you. Um, YouTube shorts, whatever it is. Like, I'm always around. So I appreciate you guys. Um, and uh, Ty, take it away. Appreciate it, Kyle. Thank you as always. And I'll, I'll tell you what, that's awesome. You and Smook out there. I'd be out there on the side cheering y'all on with a big thing of popcorn doing my thing, right? That, that'd that be the extent of what, what you'd get me to do. I uh, I did cross country. I did soccer in high school. So I've put in my dues in terms of running. I've, I've been there. I've done that. But thank you as always. Always great to get to come on here with Kyle. I love this new style that we're doing where each of us have our own little segment, but we, we rock with duos and it gives great interaction. It gives great thought process. It gives great questions. And it's just awesome to be able to talk with the man himself, Kyle Henderson and T in the background. And of course, everybody in the undefeated, as I always say, the big three are here. And anytime I get to be a part of that, it's awesome. Shout out to everybody in the undefeated. We have got a pretty loaded group. Moon Rocka says, not nah, Ty gives out Subaru to me or like a Nissan Titan or something. I actually had um, the car when I was working on the ranch, right? Because everybody around us, bunch of ranches. So from the time I was like in middle school on, I would mow everybody's ranch. Like they would let me mow. I saved up a bunch of money. My first car that I bought was a Nissan 350Z and I, a manual transmission. I loved that car. 
Um, and unfortunately, I was going back to help my mom feed horses. My dad was judging a horse show, I believe, in Brazil. And so he wasn't even in the country. I go back to try and help my my mom feed the horses, hydroplane, and go into a wall at 75 miles an hour. And that car was like a crumpled up beer can after that. I uh, How I made it out of that one, we'll never know. We'll never know. That that was a wild experience. So that was that was the end of my 350Z days. And you couldn't actually get me to drive in the rain for like a year and a half after that. Uh, I just would not do it. It was like whether I wanted to, like I had the rationalization of like, oh, you're fine. Just drive safe. But like something in my mind would just not click. It, it just I, I, I would get really antsy in the rain. Um, even if I was a passenger, I, I would get really antsy in the rain. Um because, you know, hitting a wall at 75 hydroplaning, that does something. That uh, that does something. None of the airbags went off either, which I have a bone to pick with you about that, Nissan. You know where to find me. Right here. Or I'll send Blaze. Ball's in your court, Nissan. You got a Nismo 370? Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Ty, you ever drove across a frozen steel bridge? I don't believe I have, Bama fan. See, the thing is, is growing up in Texas... You don't have like, okay, let me rephrase this. You get inclement weather in terms of the the winter stuff, but it's it's not usually a ton. It's it's nothing compared to elsewhere. Um, so I can't say I have. Now, my dad, he grew up in upstate New York. And so he 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 taught me how to do all that. Um Funny story before we dive into this, how he taught me to drive a manual transmission car. We had, an, we had an old ranch truck, and he parked it in the middle of one of our pastures. And uh, he he showed me how to do it, right? He showed me. He's like, okay, this is what you do. There's the clutch, this, that, and the other. He gets out, throws me the keys, and then hops on a horse, and is just riding the horse around me until I finally got it right. Um, and then I, that, that little truck was awesome, man. I would take that on the back roads the dirt roads where I'd go to school and we would have a lot of fun in that thing. Let me tell you what, let me tell you what little Ford Ranger, little ranch truck, right? It was just what we used to, to do, uh, to do everything. How is driving that Longhorn tie? So for those of you that have seen, we had, my family had a Longhorn, right? Huge. Like I'm not going to lie. If they ever needed a replacement for Bevo, this dude could have done it because he was the same color pattern. Um, and I used to actually ride him around. Whenever people would come down the driveway, I'd, I'd get on him and meet them. And it was always a sight to see, especially the people that would come in and be touring different ranches that would come from Europe. And I know that sounds like it's a one off, but it's not. Like you had a bunch of people from Europe that would just stop into these horse ranches and be like, oh, we just kind of want to see it. So to kind of give them a Texas experience, I'd meet them down the driveway riding a massive longhorn. And this thing's horns, for those of you that have seen it, he was huge. The person that gave him to me was who my dad worked for. Um, because my dad, uh, funnily enough that Alabama's playing UConn, my dad has a connection to UConn. He was... Uh, I think an assistant professor at UConn for a while before he decided to get into the horse industry. Well, the guy he ended up working for now has the biggest longhorns, I think, in the world, or he did. He had the Guinness Book of World Records, too. Yeah, yeah, I had the little ranger. I had the little ranger. But anyways, I only ever bought manual. Man, I, I miss it. I miss the manual transmission. Um, but, Michael, I, I realized, you know, I, I kind of had the need for speed. And, uh, I, I, I gotta be very careful, right? Like I want, there's a few cars that if I get the opportunity, I would jump one. Don't ever let me have money to where I can get a Porsche 911. But I just know that might be a problem. Jay says, Ty, when we do have serious ice in Texas, we have accidents every two or three miles. It's wild because there are very few people in Texas that know how to drive in the rain. First and foremost, Jay, you can attest to this. It'll be raining, and you'll see people in Hellcats, like rear-wheel drive, flying down the road, hydroplaning, and it's like, buddy, it's not 145 degrees anymore. Like, you, you're in a rear-wheel drive car. You got to take it easy. Texas drivers are one of a kind. 
truly one of a kind. Roll Tide from Germany, Brian says, Brian, where are you at in Germany? We have some friends out in Germany. Ty says, hey, Ty, Ty, I love your name. Great name. Strong name. Can expect great things out of you. Now, Coach Smook sent me something yesterday about a prospect that I believe that was in 2027, whose name, I, I, I'm not joking, was Blaze Hayes. You don't think that kid's destined for greatness? Let me tell you what. Ty says, would you ever drive a Lamborghini or a Ferrari? Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> let's be honest, right? I'm not, I hope to be at that point one day, but man, like you already know. I wanted that GTR. Me too. Me too. That's my dream car. That's my dream car. Was the Longhorn a manual, sadly automatic transmission, Louie. He, you know. He, he was an automatic transmission. What are you going to do? All right, guys, we've had enough talk about the, the ranch life. Let's get into some college football talk and what a day it is, right? When we're talking about Alabama college football talk right now, it might seem like it's a dry period, but there's a lot of talking points for us to dive into. First and foremost, I want to talk and highlight some of the things that Coach Womack said yesterday, some of the things that caught my attention. First and foremost, it was actually a little bit ironic because just yesterday I was asking Kyle about like if he was like hey what questions would you ask the coaching staff my concern concern strong word my question was centered around that pass rush group because Bama has got the talent there but what's this look like in this new defense well I loved getting some information on that coach Womack went into detail named several guys talked about Keanu caught talked about Quindarius Robinson talked about Quay Russo talked about a yon Pierre right that to me is really encouraging to hear the fact that he wasn't just signaling out like oh we have one guy or two guys and then you know some of the other guys are getting it he was going into detail about how Keanu caught is someone who is very explosive Coach Robinson was talking about how he wanted him at Florida whenever he was there, talking about some of the attributes he brings to the table. When they got to Quindarius Robinson, they were like, hey, this guy is smart. He's been here. He's He's been working. He's been repping. And it, it, you know, it, it shows. They talked about the leadership aspect there and how he's been able to use his experience as a positive. And he's very athletic, really looking forward to what he can do this year. I think something that the undefeated is going to love is when we dive into these final two names, right? Because you want depth at this position. You want depth at this position. And we know Cott, he's been in the system. He's been working. He's a super athletic dude. And he would have been starting at 90% of other colleges at least. Why wasn't he starting, you might ask? Oh, it's because there was a guy by the name of Chris Braswell and a guy by the name of Dallas Turner that were ahead of him. Two former five stars, Chris Braswell, the number two or three edge in the nation whenever he committed. It depends where you look because sometimes you look at these sites and Drew Sanders was listed as an athlete. Other times he was listed as an outside linebacker edge, right? So it, it depends, but you get the point, right? Now we're splitting hairs. Keanu Cott had two great pass rushers in front of him. And before those guys, you had Dallas Turner and Will Anderson. I mean, unbelievable talent there. But the names that I want to focus in on, right? Because it's great to hear about Cotton and Q-Rob. But I think we all expected that. Or at least that doesn't surprise me. Let me modify that statement. Hearing the positivity laid at Keanu Cott or Quindarius Robinson, that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me. I expected those guys to be really acclimated, really pushing. But hearing about Quay Russo, Hearing about Yonze Pierre, how Yonze Pierre, if I'm not mistaken, they said he has a rare ability. He has got a rare ability to get after the quarterback. He, I think, is going to be tough to keep off the field, but so too is Quay Russo. Coach Walmick was talking and said Quay Russo has had a phenomenal past few days. He has really been impressing, really turning heads. And this is a guy that when we're talking about versatile athletes in this Alabama defense, Russo is one of those guys you got to talk about. The versatility he brings to the table, I mean, it's really something to watch. How he was utilized in high school, how he could be utilized at the college level, I'm really excited to see it. But the fact that we were talking about four guys at least that you're looking at and saying, okay, at that one position, we feel like we have them. 
that to me was very positive to hear. Now I heard someone ask about Keon Keeley, Larry saying yeah, I, he needs to continue repping, but we must remember Larry, he just moved positions. Um, and so it's going to be very natural for him to continue needing work at this new position, right? It's not like he got to stay at the same room and build from there. Now he's learning different intricacies, different things that other people have done for a while, right? Other people have done for a while. And he's just now getting acclimated to that. So excited to see what the future holds for him. No doubt about it. Remember in Spanish, I need to see that. Uh, Brian says, what's up with Keeley? Oh, nothing, Brian. He switched positions. Um, he is now working more of a defensive line guy, right? More working in terms of maybe backing up an Overton, right? Whereas before he was more of like the pass rush guy. So we'll see how that works. But to me, whenever you switch positions, especially in spring, it's going to be very natural for you to need an entire spring before it starts really coming together. So it's a wait and see approach with Keon Keeley. I don't think that there's anything wrong. I don't think that there's anything wrong, Brian, but it's it's just it's just a time thing. You know what I mean? It's just like when we switch professions or anything like that, you do need a period to adjust. You need a period to get acclimated, and then you can start hitting the ground running. But we just need that acclimation period, and that's where we are right now. That's where we are right now. Let's see what else we have. Asking about Zion Brady. Ty, what about Zion Brady? Can we still get him? Yeah, we can still get Zion Brady. There's no doubt about that. Listen, you you maintain Freddie Roach, which is big. Right? That's big. It's not only big for Zion Brady. It's big for Justice Terry. It's big for Hilson. Like, there's several different prospects we can talk about that maintaining Freddie Roach is going to pay dividends. Now, whether that manifests itself in terms of commitments remains to be seen but it will open doors. Much like we talk about the Alabama logo, right? There are certain logos, there are certain brands in college football that may not win you a recruiting battle, but they'll open a door, right? They'll open a door. Whereas if you are, and no offense at this team, right? It is what it is. No offense to them. If you're a Purdue, Okay. And we're talking about a top ranked defensive lineman. It's more likely that Alabama is going to be able to get in that defensive lineman's recruitment battle late in the process than is a Purdue because Alabama has brand power. That brand power might get you an in home visit, that brand power might get you a late visit in terms of an unofficial or maybe an official. Not a lot of colleges have that brand power at that level. Alabama is one of them. Alabama is one of them. And, and that's that's why whenever we're asking, can they get his eye on Grady? Yes, they absolutely can. They absolutely can. It's just a matter of like what this process look like. Looks like what Zion Grady thinks about this new defense. What the talent in this new defense is looking like at that position. Several different talking points to get into. Will we see more true defensive end play this year or sticking with more edge? I think we're going to see more of like a defensive end style. But I we, we must remember it's like split, right? So you have your one side who's doing one thing, and then you have your other side, your bandit, your wolf, right? Doing a little bit different things. So it's something that it's going to be a lot of fun to see. Going to be a ton of fun to see. The other position group I really wanted to talk about today was the defensive backs. Without question, Ty Bama. Yeah, no doubt about it, man. No doubt about it, Kareem. No doubt about it. And there's not many. There's not many teams that can use a logo, not to win a recruiting battle, but to get in a door. If there's a prospect that says, oh, I, I'm, I'm, this is my top five, you're more likely as an Alabama to sneak back into that race than as a Purdue or an Oregon State or a Michigan State for that matter. That's that's the simple reality, right? There are a few teams in college football where you might hear someone release a top three, and then all of a sudden one of those few brands come in, and that's where they commit. The reason I never bat an eye, the reason I'm never surprised, is because brand power. They have it. Absolutely they have it. 
And I thought it was hilarious when people out there were trying to say they don't have it. So this is something I'm really interested in watching is on the recruiting front, what this brand power is able to do. But let's also talk about this defensive back group. Because the defensive back group, I need y'all's help in the undefeated. We've been talking a lot about that being an area where they think we'll do some work in the transfer portal. And I certainly think we might see one addition made. But where I thought before we might see more than one addition made in the transfer portal for a defensive back, I'm not so sure anymore, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not so sure anymore. Yes, you need the depth. Yes, you need the depth. But listening to the way these young guys are coming about, you still have a Jaleel Hurley. You have a Damani Jackson. You have these guys that have some experience in terms of college football. You also have a Malachi Moore. You have a Keon Sab. That's interesting to me. Plus all these young guys. Tony Mitchell. I certainly imagine Alabama will make a move in the transfer portal for a defensive back. But where I used to think we could see two, maybe three defensive backs come in via the portal, I don't know if I know think that anymore, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know. Louis says, I would really like to take, at the very least, one safety. I get that. I get that. I understand that. And this is this is the hard part, right? Because you now have to balance depth with what you have. And one of the things that Walmack was saying that I really like is he's like, Hey, we, we want to give the guys that stayed. We're giving all of our effort to them. Now, I don't think he said that verbatim, but that was the basic theorem of what he said. It was like, Hey, we know that we might need some depth, but like we, we really, the guys that stayed here, the guys that stayed here, those are the guys that we're really like pushing, working with. Is Red Morgan still playing with the ones? Indeed, Shane. And I don't know that that's a bad thing. From what I have been told, he's not looking like a freshman out there. He's not looking like a freshman. He is looking really promising. Very promising. And he's not alone. You have Xavier Mincy, who's been turning heads. You have Xavier Brown, who's been turning heads. Red Morgan has been turning heads. Jalen Mbakwe, ladies and gentlemen. I've heard some exciting things about Jalen Mbakwe. About how this coaching staff knew he was talented, knew he was athletic, but they're being blown away at just how athletic he is. Now, Jalen Mbakwe is one of those guys where he's massively going to benefit from singularity. And what I mean when I say singularity isn't necessarily saying like, oh, he won't be a punt returner or a kick returner. He's got that athleticism. What I mean when I say singularity is in high school, this young man was asked to do everything. He was a Band-Aid. He was a Band-Aid, which is great. You love getting guys that have that ability. One, because I think it absolutely helps in terms of football IQ. Right, Part of the reason why I'm so excited for a Noah Carter, because his football IQ is going to be through the roof. He's going to be able to look at everything and say, okay, well, I have experience here, 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 here. It gives you a greater understanding of the game and a greater understanding of the importance of every one person's assignment. That's a major positive. But the reason why I'm always excited whenever you get those guys and then you you set them at a position is because now they can take that understanding they formerly had, know and utilize that as an increased football IQ, but now they're repping at one position primarily over and over again. And if you thought they were good when they were everywhere, you just wait till they get settled somewhere. That's how I've always viewed Noah Carter. That's how I've always viewed Jalen and Bakwe. You think they're impressive now. You just wait. They're just scratching the surface of the ability they have. Just scratching the surface. That's an exciting prospect. Very exciting. But from what I've been told, Mbakwe, his athleticism is really shining. Now, I'm not saying that means he's going to be a starter. I, I have no idea about any of that. 
all I have been told is like they knew he was an athlete, but now that he's out there, they're like, oh, you're you're different. Like you are just a a, a wild caliber of football player. That's exciting. That's very exciting. Now he said, um, Bama fan 95 said, we need lockdown corner with this new air raid era. hundred percent, hundred percent. And I think that Bama's corners could be really, really good. I think Damani Jackson had bad habits, but Damani Jackson himself. I mean, Nick Saban wanted him bad, wanted him real bad coming out of high school. And for good reason. I don't think we remember Damani Jackson is an athletic freak. He can be a physical guy, but he also logged a 10 to 500 meter dash. I mean, he's quick. You get him right. He's got all the athleticism to be a lockdown corner. And, and he's not afraid to lay some physicality. There are clips of him at USC taking out lead blockers. I mean, just demolishing them. Louis says real bad habits at USC. And I don't, I don't blame him because if you look at their defensive back play across the board, it was filled with bad habits. And even further than that, I can't imagine how hard it is to be a defensive back knowing, hey, as much as I have to focus on my assignment, as much as I have to focus on my guy, my zone, I have to keep eyes in the backfield because if they run the ball, our front seven isn't stopping a runny nose. We're going to get ran on. So I always have this creeping thought in my head like, hey, turn around, turn around, turn around. Where, where's the ball? That, that's terrible. That, that's like not conducive to success at all for any guy out there. And that's why any guy who comes from USC, I'm always like, hey, I, let's not delve too deep into what they did at USC unless we're having the nuanced conversation of that USC defense as a whole was bad, real bad. And what's crazy is if you look, they have athletes out there. They've got some players on that defense that if you were like, oh, they have that guy? Oh, they have this guy? You'd, you'd really start to wonder, why are they so bad? Well, I'm going to, you know, rip off the Band-Aid. Alex Grinch's defenses haven't worked since his first stint in the Pac-12 at Washington State. Pretty much, well, 10 years ago at this point. Then took over Ohio State. That didn't work out. Oklahoma, that didn't work out. Back to the Pac-12 at USC. That didn't work out because the Pac, even though it is the Pac and it's not as physical, as the Big Ten or the SEC. They were certainly playing a higher brand of physical football this year. Utah was making them hurt. Making them hurt. Oregon was making them hurt. Um, so that I, I'm always hesitant with these USC guys because I I I just have never been a fan of the Alex Grinch defense. I, I just haven't. If you go over to my channel, you can find countless USC videos where, in fairness, I was right. And I'm not happy I was right. I'm one of those people I'd much rather see them be successful across the board. But I was telling USC fans at the beginning of the year, week zero, I had USC fans on my channel saying, hey, do you believe we can go to the college football playoffs? And I said, no. No, I don't. I think Caleb is sensational. I think your offensive system is not the problem. I think your defense is a major problem. And I just don't think you can be successful foregoing one side of the football in favor of the other. Now, USC has made some great hires this offseason, ladies and gentlemen. I know there's a lot of people that like, why would Justice Terry flip from Georgia to USC? Well, Coach Henney is the answer, Coach Henderson. Coach Henderson comes to USC by way of the NFL where he just got told, or he just got, <laughs> I read Louie's comment, right, as I said that, I told them that, yeah, their defense was terrible. Uh, Coach Henney just got done working with an Aaron Donald, and Aaron Donald was just on USC's campus talking up Coach Henney. They made some really good hires. How it works out, I don't know. I don't know, and I'm not even going to project. But they got Matt Entz who is the head coach of North Dakota State. He's now coaching linebackers. Coach Henney is now coaching the uh, interior defensive line. Coach Sua, who came from Michigan, 
a few years ago. He's going to be working there with him. Um, interested in their defensive backfield, because I think Belk is back there, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, he's secondary coach at USC, Doug Belk. Right, Doug Belk was a graduate assistant at Alabama from 2014 to 2016 from Valdosta, Georgia. So not only do you have Coach Henney out there who, who's been working with NFL defensive linemen, and when I say Aaron Donald was out there, Aaron Donald wasn't just there. Aaron Donald was talking to these defensive linemen, Justice Terry, Elijah Griffin. I, I The name of the other kid who committed escapes me, and I, I sincerely apologize for that, but he was in the wave of commitments USC got. They were talking up this coaching staff. So USC... It's going to be interesting to see what they're going to be, but let's understand when we're talking about Damani Jackson, we need to understand what they were. And that was not Damani Jackson's fault. They had very talented defensive players looking like they didn't know what to do. And at the point where it's across the board, it's systematic. It's a systematic problem. It was the same systematic problem that Oklahoma fit. Yes, it was the other, it was the it was the other kid from Georgia the edge rusher, who's a top prospect. Now, whether they can hold on to him remains to be seen, right? That conversation could be had for everybody, though. Antoine says, Caught, Russo, Pierre, Kirov, Overton, Keeley, those guys getting to the quarterback consistently is way more important than who we have lined up at corner. I can agree to a point. I can certainly agree to a point. The only thing that I, I would say to that, Antoine, is these offenses now, we have to remember, even when we had Will Anderson, Will had an incredible season, but offenses are going to be scheming to nullify those guys. Now, when I say nullify, put that in quotations, right? Nullify. Good luck nullifying those guys. What I mean is you're going to see quick passes. You're going to see guys getting the ball in space. And while I completely agree, if you do have the presence on the exterior and in your backfield, you can really start making them pay for those quick passes. I'll put it like this. Damani Jackson, there were several plays that I have on my computer where he's at USC and they'll throw a quick pass and he knocks someone's head off. Damani Jackson's got a lot more physicality. He's displayed it at times than I think people realize. So it, you're 100% right, Antoine. You can really help out a young secondary with the defensive line play. If you can nullify a quarterback having the ability to sit back, have five seconds to scan because your pass rush is getting there, you're just helping out your secondary. But if your secondary can play aggressive, can play fast and is cohesive, and they can jump on those early passes, your wide receivers aren't going to want to catch those screens whenever you have Damani Jackson coming in who runs a 10 to 500 knocking your head off or a Zay Mincy knocking your head off. Red Morgan knocking your head off, right? They're not going to want to do that after about the third time. So it, it's one of those things. You you are you are a hundred percent right. You are a hundred percent right, though, Antoine. A thousand percent. If you do have that mauling pass rush ability, you can really help your young defensive backs come along because they don't have to worry about like, oh, I might have to be in coverage man on man for six seconds. They're not getting six seconds. Someone's going to get free. And, and to add on to this, you're 100% right, Antoine, but let's take it one step further. You list all the talent. What about the aggressiveness of Womack? He's not going to let you stand in comfort. He's going to, he's going to heat you up. He is going to heat you up. So when we when we I'm leaving this comment here because it's such an interesting thing to theory craft on, right? You can tell my nerdiness as I say something like theory craft. I'm sorry. But hey, it helps that I'm such a nerd because like, you know, I I, I study college football and I, I try and learn something. I try and learn. You think about all this talent, and then you think about the aggressive nature of Womack. Boy, man, I think some opposing quarterbacks are going to think like, oh, I'm going to have a day and they're going to get their head taken off. I pray to God for some of these opposing quarterbacks that their running backs know how to block. Because if not, <laughs> if not, good luck. You're going to have a tough day. Antoine says pressure bursts pipes 
hundred percent. And it creates diamonds. We all, yeah, true, true. I'm in safe company here. I'm in safe. Hey, hey, y'all don't say that. Hey, y'all don't say that. Quoting Step Brothers. In my opinion, Terry goes back to Georgia. It's fully possible. It's fully possible. It's as as great as USC is doing in recruiting. They need to show the defensive improvement this year. They need to show the defensive improvement this year. If they don't show improvement, I just don't know that they're going to be able to hang on to some of those guys. I just don't. Because you have Bama knocking for some of them. You have Georgia coming for some of them. You got Larry Johnson at Ohio State coming for some of them. That's tough. And if you're not showing improvement, if you're showing stagnation, Bama doesn't do stagnation. Right? And Larry Johnson up there at Ohio State, he can recruit his tail off. I've been waiting for that man to retire. Years. <laughs> I'm just like, Larry, please. You've contributed to the game. Please go enjoy your vacation home. Go enjoy your time with your family. You've earned it, Larry, please. <laughs> Al says, morning, Ty. Our approach to coverage now is sophisticated for sure, but defensive backs will be more eyes on quarterback, more zone schemes. Combine that with our pressure and you're t- that you're talking about. Are- yeah, 100%. 100%. That's that's my word for it, Moon. Anytime I'm thinking about like what could be, I always call it theory crafting. Ooh, this is a good one. Caleb, let me answer this one here in a bit. Patriot Life says, Gifted 5, Bama Football on YouTube with Kyle Henderson memberships. Spam those Patriot Life emojis in the chat. You guys know, this show isn't possible without you and the undefeated, without great supporters. Without great supporters like Patriot Life. And it does truly mean the world to us. And if you are the beneficiary of one of these sponsorships, or one of these memberships, I should say, be sure to think Patriot Life. Right? Be sure to think Patriot Life. If you notice that now you have a green name, be sure to think Patriot Life. Patriot, I, it, it's, it's always hard for me to articulate uh, my appreciation, not only for you, but for, for all of you. Taking a moment to be real here for a second, and then we'll dive back into football. We're going to talk about Caleb's question. Top five SEC quarterbacks. That's a fun one, Caleb. I love that. That's a really fun one. I love that. But taking a moment to be real real fast, it, it's it's always hard for me to articulate how much I appreciate all of you, how much I appreciate Kyle, T in the background, because this isn't possible. And I know I say that all the time, but you guys don't get it. It's not possible without you. Even me on my channel, right? It's not possible without all of your great support. Without you guys, I'd be talking into a void. You guys have really helped me try and take a dream and transition it into a reality. And for that, I don't quite know the right words. But that's exactly why, if you're always wondering, why is Ty always thinking? That's why. Because I don't know the right words. All I know how to do is continue telling you how much it means to me. Uh, Because I I don't know that I'll, I'll ever be able to fully articulate what it means. But I can tell you every day how appreciative I am. Because I understand that this is this is a blessing. That's not lost on me. And the blessing doesn't come from out without y'all. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let's talk about this top five quarterback list. This is a good one. Let's look this up, right? So when we look at this, there are going to be some really interesting quarterbacks in the SEC this year. I can tell you who's not going to be in the top five right now. Patriot Life following it up with the $20. We appreciate you and the whole team, man. This team over here is fantastic. And certainly everybody in the undefeated is a part of that team. Thank you very much, Patriot Life, for the $20. Thank you so much for the gifted subs. Thank you for the support. Spam those Patriot Life emojis, ladies and gentlemen. I want to see them flying in chat. 
I want to see them flying in chat. I'll tell you who's not going to be a top five guy. I'm not going to do that. That's messed up. We won't do that. It It is hard. It is. It really is, man. It really is, Louie. Because it comes off as soppy. Like, I, I don't I don't know the right words. Um, but it's not lost on me. And I do want you guys to know that this this is this isn't lost on me, and I am unbelievably appreciative of even people hopping in chat and hanging out talking football. I'm extremely appreciative of that. So we'll start with number five, then go up. Let me build my list real fast. And then we will go into it. Ooh. Okay. At number five. At number five, we're rolling with Brady Cook. Brady Cook, the reason why I'm rolling with Brady Cook, he's going to have wide receivers around him. That's going to be an offense that attempts to utilize his skill sets, and he has experience. He'll be a senior. That's something I'm really going to be watching. Missouri is a team that far exceeded expectations last year, ladies and gentlemen. Let's remember this when we speak on Missouri. Entering into the year, there were two coaches that myself and I think pretty much everybody out there was like, hey, these two guys have to have a good year or they're done. It was Drinkwitz at Missouri, and it was Neil Brown. They had to have a great year, or they were done. Clint Eastwood, happy to see you. Wendy says, I'm curious what brought back John McNulty to the staff, who has ties to the NFL pin in Notre Dame right after my college. What's your take on our chances with him? Wendy, I will get to that question. I'm going to go ahead and start. I'm going to go ahead and star that right now, and after we do these top quarterbacks, that's where we'll go into that. That's where we'll go into that. So Cook is going to be my number five. He's got the experience. He returns some in a, or he returns some wide receivers that he has familiar, familiarity at. And I think that's going to be a major contribution to success. Number four. I'm going to go Beck at number four. Now, this was tricky for me. Where to put Beck was tricky for me because I I don't dislike Beck. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he's a world beater. That's not my contention here. But I, I always respect quarterbacks who understand this is what my assignment is. This is what our system is. And I'm going to play within the system. I, I, I really appreciate quarterbacks that understand I'm going to play within the system. I think he'll be better this year. Because he'll have more time. To give him five over Arnold. Are you talking Jackson Arnold Moon? Listen, Jackson Arnold almost made the cut for me. But here's the thing. It's hard for me to give a guy props like a Nico or a Jackson Arnold when I haven't seen them put in a full work year of work yet. Now, if you're talking me quarterbacks that I think could shock SEC fans, Jackson Arnold. Right, like that's a name to watch. From Denton Geyer High School, bigger kid, but do not mistake his athleticism. Here at Denton Geyer, he hit 21 miles per hour at six foot two, 225. One Elite 11 MVP, one Gatorade Player of the Year. He's got so much ability. The only reason Arnold, and, and I, I want to let this known, In my list, I'm not listing quarterbacks that haven't had at least one year starting experience. Right? Because that would be more theoretical. And that's going to be tough. But Arnold, if you are listing quarterbacks that you believe will be there, I do not mind Jackson Arnold. Ladies and gentlemen, I think he's going to be very good. But I do want the caveat to be known. My list is guys that have at least one year starting because it's a little bit easier to go off of that. 
Um, so if there is an Oklahoma fan in here, first off, I don't I don't have to tell you guys. You guys know how high I am on Jackson Dart. If you're an Oklahoma fan in here, I've never hid that. I've never hid how high I am on Jackson Arnold. That kid is going to be really, really good. OU actually has another quarterback behind him, Malik Hawkins, who's going to be really, really good. Um, fun. A lot of fun. Number four, we had Beck, right? So number five, we have Cook from Missouri. Four, we have Beck. At number three, we're going Jackson Dart. Reason why is pretty simple. Jackson Dart's very good. He's now with Lane Kiffin. He's been with Lane Kiffin. That continuity will be big for his game. And it's it's Lane. We can expect his quarterbacks to do something. And Jackson Dart has the ability. So Jackson Dart comes in at number three for me. Jackson Dart comes in at number three for me. At number two. We have a newcomer to the SEC, Quinn Ewers. Why do I say Quinn Ewers? Well, ladies and gentlemen, when we look at Quinn Ewers' stats from last season, he improved in a lot of areas that he needed to improve on from 2022. He finished the year with a 69% completion percentage, 3,400 yards, 22 touchdowns to six interceptions. Now, that being said, when I say Quinn, this is more of a projection. Because Quinn is one of those guys that if he gets it right, he's really tough to stop. And we know this. We know this as Alabama fans. When Quinn Ewers is on, when he's in his flow state, he's going to drop dimes. The problem is his consistency with Quinn Ewers. But ladies and gentlemen, he forewent the NFL draft. He didn't go because he realized, I still got things to work on. He was ninth in the Big 12 in terms of deep ball accuracy. But a lot of the reason that deep ball accuracy wasn't higher is because he doesn't always set his feet. Ewers is one of those guys. I covered him in high school. So I, I'm, I will admit as well, there is a level of bias here. There is a, well, PK... His best game was against an SEC team. So I hear you. It's going to be more difficult, but his best game was against an SEC team. I love Alabama. He torched Bama. He That moonshot pass he hit to Xavier Worthy was one of the most beautiful passes I've seen all year where it was a, a all the way up and down. And they had two All-American corners Caleb Downs, Malachi Moore. Like, that secondary for Alabama last year was great. And what we saw is that when Quinn is consistent in his approach, when he's consistent in his footwork, when he's consistent in setting and then burning, turn and burn, he's got all the ability you could want. Now, PK, here's where I do agree with you, though, my man. It's much different doing it one time and then doing it for a whole season. I've always said this about Quinn Ewers. I need him to stop being... I need him to stop. Well, that's true, Louis. That's true. Milro didn't have a great game, but that, you know, I can't take that away from uh, from yours. Lance says, worthy fastest player in football down still just, yeah, no doubt about it. But that, uh, that shot he hit worthy with, I don't know that I could have handed it off to worthy any better than that. Worthy was running and just did this chat and the ball hit him in the hands. Listen, I'm not happy about it either. You guys, for those of you that know, for those of you that know, I record with a bunch of Texas fans. So I, I had to hear about it. PK says he passed for more yards against Oklahoma, but we're talking objectively speaking, the best game he played was against Alabama. And he's fragile, he says. Well, that that that's true. That the last part is true. There's no arguing that. Quinn has got to be consistently healthy. He's got to be consistently healthy. He put it, yeah, he, I'm not going to lie, man. His, PK, listen, I'm not happy about it. Go back and watch that game. And I bet you'll, you'll come away being like, okay. Yeah, he, he was throwing some dimes. I don't know that it was an easy touchdown, John. Like that was a moonshot pass that viewers hit him with. It, it, it was a beautiful throw. I'm not happy about it, but that's the facts. 
that's true. That's true. But he was still putting the ball in a bread basket. True. True, true, true. This is 100% true, Jermaine. And this is exactly what I said when I was saying Quinn needs to be a full-time employee. He can't be a part-time employee anymore. The reason why I am hard on Quinn Ewers, and you can ask Texas fans, I am hard on Quinn Ewers, is because I know how good he can be. I've covered him since he was in high school. I was with Dave Campbell's Texas football as an intern working at the state championship game where he and the five-star quarterback were dueling it out. The five-star quarterback that ended up going to Clemson, Cade Klubnik. Whether it was a busted coverage or not, PK, you have to hit the ball in someone's hands, in stride, and that's exactly what he did. Whether it was a busted coverage or not, his receiver never broke stride and did this and hit it. Listen, I'm not happy about it either, but I, I, I'm a college football analyst as a whole. So I, I'm, I, I got to, you know, I'm not happy about it either. I wanted us to torch them. I wanted us to absolutely torch them. This is 100% true, Jermaine. Well, Shane, that's not, that's not, that's disingenuous, Shane. That's, that's a disingenuous statement. You're saying he couldn't see the field at OSU. He had CJ Stroud ahead of him, who was already the starter, returning starter, and he got to OSU in August. He didn't even get there in time for summer. Like he was he was coming while the camps had already started. And at the point that he came to Ohio State when camps had already started, they're not going to spend their time with a guy that should be in his senior year of high school getting him acclimated when they need to get their second string quarterback ready. You get what I mean? Like it doesn't make sense logically. If you come in and we have two weeks of fall camp left, why am I going to put all my time and energy into you when you are you don't even know the playbook? I got to get my second string quarterback ready. What if our guy gets hurt? I got to get him ready. So that was that was the situation at uh, Ohio State. That's not necessarily that, – that's there's, there's far more nuance into that one. Now, I, I agree completely with you here, Leonardo. Um, give creds to Sark for making it easy on him. I agree with that. Sark's scheme is amazing. True. True. He's supposed to be great. No doubt about it. So my number two is Quinn. And that's off of projection. If he can put it all together, he has got a lot of ability. He will make defenses pay. And he has Steve Sarkeesian. So I think when you, when you mix it all together, I think Quinn Ewers, if he has a good year, he will be really good. He will be really, really good. My number one. I think you guys can already get it. Jalen Milrow. And I say this as a Bama fan, but also I say this as a college football analyst. Okay? Uh, And listen, undefeated. I, I love I even love when we have a disagreement because this is great, right? We're we're talking great football here. We're talking great football here. Even if you disagree with me, right? We're we're, we're talking ball. This is a great conversation. I say this because Jalen Milrow has got a skill set that no other quarterback in the SEC has. Jalen Milrow had the second highest deep ball accuracy in the nation behind only Jaden Daniels on deep balls, especially in the middle third. He was 70%. 20 yards or more, he was 70%. He can hit the deep shot like nobody's business. Well, Adam, here's the thing. Quinn Ewers was ninth in the Big 12 in deep ball accuracy. He doesn't hit the deep ball near as well as Jalen Milrow. Now, that's also because Quinn doesn't set his feet. Quinn needs to set his feet more consistently. Quinn is one of those dudes that was so supremely gifted in high school, he would just like flick a a pass because he was just like, okay, I'm that guy. 
right? But when you get to college, you got to set your feet. You got to turn and burn. You got to do all of that. Um, Jalen Milrow, I think we are vastly underestimating his skill set here. I think we are vastly underestimating his skill set. Adam says Ewers makes better reads. That is also due to having an offensive coach that can help him break down those reads and an offensive philosophy that doesn't make him do a lot of reads. He has an offensive philosophy, Adam, that massively cuts down on how much processing he has to do. Jalen Milrow has not... Ha I'll ask everybody in the undefeated this. Name me the, co the coach that's worked with Jalen Milrow since he's been at Alabama that's anybody near the level of A.J. Milwee and Steve Sarkeesian. This is a genuine question. This isn't facetious. Name me the quarterback coach Jalen Milrow has worked with that's anywhere near the level of A.J. Milwee, who went with Sark, and Steve Sarkeesian. He had a quarterback coach in Bill O'Brien who told him he wasn't a quarterback. And I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. Bill O'Brien didn't try. Bill O'Brien fires me up. You want to get me mad? I'm going to talk about Bill O'Brien. Bill O'Brien, it's your job as a mentor to teach and mentor this young man. And you turned your back on him. Like, what are we doing? That's your job, to be a leader of young men, and you turned your back on him. For a full year, while Quinn Ewers was getting developed by Steve Sarkeesian, Jalen Milrow has a guy that won't even acknowledge him. Puts him a year behind. We fast forward. He then goes to Tommy Reese. Now listen, Tommy tried. I, I will give Tommy this. Tommy tried. Tommy Reese never worked with a quarterback like Jalen Milrow, ever, ever. He has never worked with a quarterback comparable to Milrow's skill sets. He didn't know how to. And in fairness, it's not like he'd been there three years. I think if Tommy Reese was at Alabama behind a Bill O'Brien for like two years, we would have seen a much better offense because he would have understood Milrow. He would have understood how to work with him. He would have understood Bama's offense. But K Spray, you you put it here perfectly. Tommy Reese was not only still learning how to be a Division I Power Five offensive coordinator, he was still learning Alabama's offense. He didn't get to bring his offense. He had to learn Bama's. And so, Shane, I do agree. Reese was lost. Now, I don't necessarily fault Reese for that. That's why you'll kind of always see me defend Reese at a certain level, and that's not to say he's abstained from blame. That's not my point. That's not my point. I'm not saying he doesn't deserve any blame. I, that's not what I'm arguing here. My point is, is I, I do think with Reese there is a nuanced conversation. But... Adam, this is where I completely disagree with you. How much pre-snap motion do we have under Tommy Reese? None. Pre-snap motion is something that helps the quarterback identify what they're in. How many times did we see screens with Tommy Reese? Very little. That's something that, to someone pointed it out earlier, that's something that Steve Sarkeesian did amazing with Quinn Ewers, is we're going to hit you underneath Brian. Texas has a lot of quick screens. If I'm not mistaken, Quinn Ewers threw 28.4% of his passes at or behind the line of scrimmage. Maybe, maybe, don't quote me on that. I'm not come, but I, I, I know it was somewhere in that range. I know it was somewhere in that range. Well, then why didn't we do it when Ty Simpson was in? Or Ty Buckner was in? Adam, your argument fundamentally falls apart whenever those guys had an opportunity against a team in USF where we were in a position to where we had to throw quick screens because it was raining so much and he still didn't call them in a game where it's a downpour. The only friend you have in the passing game. And that was like a monsoon that Bama played in the only hope you have in the passing game in those situations is quick screens. Get the ball out quick. We didn't even see it with Ty Simpson. We didn't see it with Buckner, not at the rate it should have been called. 
So, yeah, uh, let me see, Kevin. Did you see my question? Hey, Ty, I had to step out for a few minutes. Can uh, I missed the beginning. We're listing the top five quarterbacks in the SEC. And also, Adam, if you're hitting the deep ball at 70%, you can hit a short pass. You can hit a short pass. He can hit a short pass. I agree with this, Travel Panner. Reese was in over his head. So, we didn't run pre-snap motion, which would help him identify what a defense is doing. We didn't run quick screens. We didn't run running back screens. Our offense wasn't creative. And if you're a young quarterback, this is this is what I think like you guys hit so aptly on is like with Quinn Ewers, he has Sark. Sark's going to make the game easy for him. Sark is going to have foundational play calling where things build upon each other. I might call a screen, a screen, a screen, and then I'm going to hit you over top. Why? Because I've gotten your whole defense to sink for it. It wasn't the first screen I called wasn't about getting a first down. Maybe the second screen I called, it's not about getting a first down. I'm calling these screens to lay the foundation, to plant the seed in your head. Come up. This is what we want to do. And then I'm going to hit you over top. Brilliant analysis of this. Mac Jones, whenever he had Steve Sarkeesian. Right? Mac Jones, whenever we had Steve Sarkeesian. Do y'all remember those little screens we would run to Devontae Smith or Waddle? And then we would run them, we would run them, we would run them. And after about the fourth or fifth one, they would do a fake screen where Devontae Smith looked like he was going to block for the guy behind him, and he would just shed the guy and burn. Well, the safety was already in a full sprint to get to the guy behind Devontae Smith because the foundational play calling, we had laid the foundation, we had planted the seed, we inceptioned them. It's like inception. You planted the seed. That was one of my favorite plays with Devontae Smith is these these screens that we would run with Mac Jones and Steve Sarkeesian where it was quick, quick, quick. And then on the fourth one, it's not a screen. It looks like a screen because it's the same foundation. It's the same setup, but he's going to fake the block, shed it, and it's easy to shed that block because the guy's wanting to get to the receiver behind you. So you shed that. The safety's full screaming down, and Devontae Smith is over their head. Touchdown. Easy. Easy money. That's foundational play calling. That's brilliance. Simplicity is the key to brilliance. And we didn't have that. We did not have that last year. Simplicity is the key to brilliance. Foundational play calling is a thing of beauty. We didn't have it. Now we have Kalen DeBoer. Now we have Kalen DeBoer. Well, Adam, I can tell you why Sar- or what you were struggled. He didn't set his feet. That's not on Steve Sarkeesian. That's not on Steve Sarkeesian. Quinn Ewers has such a phenomenally gifted arm that he got away with doing things the wrong way in high school. He didn't have to have perfect footwork. He didn't have to go through things because he had an arm that's blessed and he could just boom, hit him. Oh, it, it it certainly is on Reese. It certainly is. Sark, th- the difference is, Adam, is you're, you're cutting out an entire part of this equation. You're relating Steve Sarkeesian and Quinn Ewers saying, oh, well, Ewers wasn't perfect. Ewers wasn't perfect while Steve Sarkeesian gave him foundational play calling, gave him pre-snap motion, gave him easy outlets. Reese did none of that. So, yes, while, so it's not it's not in Sark, but it's on Reese, yes. And I'm going to explain to you right now why. I'm going to explain to you right now why. Because we've already established that Steve Sargeesian was doing foundational play calling, yes? Right? Like, that's that's one of the things he does. We've already established that Steve Sarkeesian's going to run a healthy amount of pre-snap motion. This is all true. All of those things are information gathering, not only for the offensive mind, but for the offensive quarterback. Offensive quarterback. For the quarterback. I apologize. So if you were struggled, it was probably not because of the play calling. And I'm not saying that it was always perfect play calling. A lot of your struggles came down to not properly setting your feet. 
Now let's let's take that, right? Now let's equate that to Jalen Milrow. Now, while I agree with you, there were times Jalen Milrow didn't properly set his feet. He didn't have foundational play calling. He didn't have any of that. He didn't have quick passes dialed up for him. We're saying, oh, it's because he couldn't do it. If that's the case, Adam, why didn't we see that against USF? When it's a monsoon and we're still not calling quick passes. Because Reese didn't do it. That's the truth of the matter. Steve Sarkeesian lays down foundational play calling to help his quarterback. What did Tommy Reese do to help Jalen Milrow? No, my arguments aren't based on speculation. My arguments are based on film analysis and talking to people who are in these situations. You're also talking about an offensive line for Alabama that ranked 129th in the nation. But these aren't based on speculation, Adam. I'm a, I'm not speculating. I'm talking of what was. I'm talking about what was on film. I'm not saying what could be. Speculation is what could be. I'm talking about what was. Tommy Reese didn't give Jalen Milrow the foundational play calling to make things easy for him. Right? It, it just didn't happen. look at the Michigan game. I've, I've, I have the all 22 of the Michigan game. That's what I'm saying, Adam. I'm, I'm watching all 22. And these arguments I'm making are from people that work with quarterbacks. I was on a phone call yesterday with a college football quarterback trainer who also trains MLB players. This was the conversation we were having. So this isn't just my analysis. This is also analysis that people that know the game far better than I have affirmed. Right? It, it's This is not just my analysis. Now, going through my top five list. Oh, it is a great debate. It is a great debate. And it's all love, Adam. It's all love. It's all love. And guys, I don't think that Adam hates Milrow. You can have disagreements, and that's fine, right? Families disagree. We're talking ball. Everything is respectful right now. Everything is pure analysis. This is a great conversation. This is what sports are all about, is having these great debates, right? This is awesome. This is It's all love. Adam is a fantastic supporter of Alabama. He wants to see Milrow be the quarterback. I know he can. He can be. This is all love. This is all love. This is us talking football. Caleb says, I'll list mine. One, Beck. Two, Ewers. Three, Dart. Four, Milrow. Five, Cook. Arnold and Tennessee quarterback are right there. I can't wait to see Nico. I can't wait to see Jackson Arnold. For those of you missing out, 100%, Adam. And you know, you already know I respect your opinion as well. I 100% respect your opinion. No doubt about it, man. Great contributor. Great. Always giving great support over here. Adam is critical. There's a difference in hate and critical. Okay. And that's, that's, it, it might seem like a fine line. And the reason it seems like a fine line, Adam, has nothing to do with you. It's because we live in a society of haters. Right. It's like living, we, we have so many haters in society that now critical questions can come off as just like hating when that might not be the intent, but because we just have like so many people. So many people who just like, you know. So it's all love, man. It's all love. This is great. You guys know I love football debates. It, 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 it's all love. My top five. I have Milrow number one. Two, I'm going Quinn Ewers. Three, I'm going Jackson Dart. Four, I'm going Carson Beck. Five, I'm going Cook. Only reason why you don't see Nico, only reason why you don't see a Jackson Arnold is because that would be projection. And though I think they're going to be really fun, Though I think they're going to be really fun, I, I wanted to do these three right here. Certified Hater says, hot take with Milrow. Uh, Milrow with Sark beats Michigan. Hot take. Alabama with an offensive line that ranks it from 50 to 80 beats Michigan. How wild is that to think about, ladies and gentlemen? How wild is that to think about? That a middle-of-the-pack offensive line 
a middle of the pack offensive line would have won the national championship last year. I, I truly believe that. I truly believe that. Now, that being said, hats off to Michigan. You went out there and got it done as much as it hurts me to admit it. I hate admitting it because I know how close we were. I know the deficiencies in that game. Shout out to Michigan, man. You won it. You won it. Y'all get bragging rights for the year. It is what it is. Congratulations on the season. But dang it, is that a frustrating one, man. Easily, in my opinion, one of the more frustrating losses I've seen uh, an Alabama team incur under Nick Saban. Easily one of the more frustrating losses. But they went on to win the national championship. Hats off to them. I'm I'm one of those people, though, chat, undefeated. If, if Bama's going to lose, I want it to be to the national champion, right? Because at least I want the argument when people are like, oh, Bama wasn't that good. I can look at them and be like, well, who'd you lose to? Who'd you lose to? Because Bama got beat by the team that ended up bringing home the hardware, and your team was sitting at home watching. They didn't even make it to the dance. So we're not the same. We're not the same. Not all losses are created equal. Yes, I understand wins are wins, losses are losses. It's a lot different beating Georgia by 45 than beating New Mexico State by three. It's a lot different losing to Michigan by two than it is losing to UConn football by 30. Not all wins are created equal. Not all losses are created equal. Remember that. At the end of the day, a win is a win and a loss is a loss. But there's nuance and context in those conversations. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Oh, I, I agree with this, Brian. I think the blame is more spread out than simply offense. Um, You had it. If we don't bust a coverage, it doesn't even go into overtime. If Bama doesn't bust a coverage, they get the fourth down stop, they ice the clock, game, set, match, they move forward to play Washington in the national championship. Man, that that to me, what before I get out of here undefeated, what's the most frustrating loss for y'all under Nick Saban? Because that Michigan game might have been it for me. And not in terms of like where you're looking at the coaching staff being like, oh, this is on you. It's just like the the totality of the situation. And you're like, man. Why? Now, Moon Rocka, you're right here. You're right. Objectively speaking, you are right. Our offense wasn't able to sustain. Y you are right. Ooh, we got some great answers. LSU 9-6, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Bama, I'm assuming you're 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 uh, referencing the same one. The kick six, how could that not be? That might be the right answer. That's a great one. The kick six is Clemson 2018. That's a good one. That's a good one. Ooh, Larry. UGA when we lost our wide receivers. Hell of an answer, Larry. Hell of an answer. 2019 LSU, that's a good one. That's a good one. 2010. That's a good one. That's a really good one. The, another one for me is the uh, the cam back, as I call it. Whenever Cam Newton and Auburn, we were kicking their tail at halftime, and then after half, they just waylaid them. Oh, I'm... Okay. I'm going to come clean to chat. That's one game I even refuse to rewatch. I refuse to rewatch that game. I've never rewatched it. Okay, I, I've rewatched it, but like, I've never rewatched the entirety of the game. That's a frustrating one for me. This is a brutal segment. <laughs> hey. This is the thing, though. We as Alabama fans, it's a little bit different, right? Because we can only point to a few games out there. For the rest of college football, Moon, this is their reality. You know what I mean? This is their reality. William, I love the answer, all losses. My man, I love that answer. 
2014 because all we had ooh that's a good one that's a good one yeah jimmy you you beat me to it man you beat me to it i didn't see your comment but you 100% beat me to it that's that's a bad one that's a bad one wendy i am so sorry i got into that quarterback conversation let's this will be what we end our segment on Zoller's announcement today, chance, yes or no. If I'm, I don't know that an offer was extended, Wendy. I don't know that at least a committable offer was extended because I think they might want more time to evaluate. So I, I don't, I, I would imagine that he does not pick Alabama. I would imagine that it won't be Alabama. I love Zoller's game, but I don't know if he got a committable offer. I've heard conflicting reports on that. So don't take that from me. Look into it. Um, I've heard conflicting reports. True. 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 You guys at the same time said this. Those are both really good points. Which, Jimmy, how insane is that? How insane is that? Just remember, Saban had 15 more first-round picks than losses. That is unbelievable, man. I don't know that that will ever be redone. Like, genuinely, I, that's, that is an unbelievable achievement. How about, ooh, this is a good one. Um, how about best win? Ooh, that's a good one. Do you know what? I think that the the game where Tua came in at halftime, second and 26, that is, that's a an amazing moment. An amazing moment. For me, I wasn't born then, Hacker. 92, Miami. I, was, I wasn't born yet. Sorry, I had to send a text. Texas 09. That's a good one. That's a good one. I, I've heard some crazy stories about that game, Poetic. I've I've heard some crazy stories about that game. And then the following year with Jalen, that's going to be a Disney movie, right? I mean that that's the, what we're talking about. I also love. Um, now this isn't a game, but one of my favorite sequences is Bama versus Clemson, where Nick Saban comes out of halftime with the onside kick, and when they get it, Nick Saban's face, man. Nick Saban's face looking across the field at Dabo Sweeney and smiling at him, letting him know, like, yeah, I got you there. You didn't expect that, did you? It's it's not only the onside kick, but it was Nick's reaction, looking at Dabo and being like, I got you there, huh? You didn't think I'd do that one, did you? What, like a Kodak moment, man. Yeah, and gives the dude the handshake. Like, I get chills thinking about that moment because of Saban's reaction. I mean, what? Because you're talking about top-minded. off. You're talking about top-minded football minds going at it, right? And the statistical probability of a team coming out at halftime, kicking an onside kick, it's, it's, it's an anomaly. It's not going to happen. And especially when you think of Nick Saban, you're like, that guy's not going to do it. He comes out and does it, and it was his reaction. Oh, man. That moment to me was so cool. So cool. That was a good one. My favorite season to watch, two in the rideouts. How could it not be? Demetrius had to be there. Oh, man. Those games were over at halftime. Yeah, no doubt. Hurts come back against UGA. That, that's a storybook chilling moment, too. How and when did you become a Bama fan? So Ephraim, my house was split, right? My mom had family attend the University of Alabama. And my dad 
like I said, he he was a he was an assistant professor at UConn. My dad has a crazy story, right? He graduated from Cornell, um, went to be an assistant professor at UConn, working his way up to be a professor, decided that he didn't like that and he wanted to be like a horse trainer. So he moved to Nebraska and he lived on a ranch in a trailer working on horse ranches until he could save up his own money to buy his own ranch here in Texas. So I have no ties to the state of Texas outside of my parents happened here. I got no family in tech. Well, I had one uncle who unfortunately passed away years ago, who was the basketball coach at LBJ. For any of you in the Austin area, if you remember Bobby Hayes, whenever he uh, unfortunately passed at the Whataburger tournament, that was my uncle. That was the only family I had in Texas, but neither here nor there. Ephraim, it was, it was a choice, right? For me, we didn't have consistent cable, and because we worked on a horse ranch, there were no off days. So sometimes we wouldn't even get to watch college football on Saturdays, but we would record games. And my mom always needed to record the Bama games. My dad always recorded the Nebraska games. And I, I just, as I continued to grow up, I had a deep love for, you know, I had a deep appreciation for both teams. Just because I, I remember the Eric Crouch Nebraska teams because I had them on VHS. I had them on VHS. Those Eric Crouch Nebraska team when the Nebraska defense was referred to as the black shirts, like, come on, man. Come on. Great college football to watch. But I was always enamored by Alabama. And then a man named Sean Alexander started playing. And that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. After that, it was just like, I'd always been an Alabama fan, but Sean Alexander sent my fandom, not only of Alabama, but of college football through the roof. Through the roof. Right? I, I, I loved watching him play. Like, it, it was just unbelievable watching him play football. I sent my fandom of college football into an entirely new era, made me love running back play. I mean, for the longest time, I was obsessed with running back play. That's what I would just like hone in on. Anytime I'd go to my school in Gainesville, I'd get on the computer and I'd start looking up when the teacher wasn't looking running back stats because, man, and Sean Alexander just took my love of college football to a new level. But Ephraim, when I was in high school, I actually was all set to go to Alabama, right? That's why I have those were called bull. Oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. This was my visit. Let's see if this will. Alabama versus Western Carolina, tw 2012. All right. I got to go to the game. Still have the ticket. Keep it right there. Um, I was all set to go to Alabama for undergrad, but I I always thought I would go to law school, and I didn't get a full ride scholarship to Alabama, um, and I didn't want to graduate undergrad with a bunch of debt, and then go to law school and get even more debt. And so I uh, I ended up going to UNT because they had a great program. I was going to major in political science with a minor in business law. UNT had been really an up-and-coming political science department, had been gaining national recognition, and they gave me a, a massive scholarship. And so I was able to go to UNT, um, not have any debt, and I ended up not going to law school. And had I known, Ephraim, I wasn't going to law school, I'd have been at Alabama. I'd have gone to Alabama for college. That's where I wanted to go. That's where I that's where I wanted to go. But I, I thought I was going to go to law school and I really didn't want to graduate law school with like a quarter million dollars of debt. Um, so, yeah, I've been an Alabama fan since I can remember. I've been an Alabama fan since I can remember. My mom, big time Alabama fan. And and people in our family actually went to Alabama because people don't, I don't know how many people know this. There's actually a connection between Vir the University of Virginia and the University of Alabama. If I'm not mistaken, well, let me, before I, If 
if I'm not mistaken, when I took my visit to the University of Alabama, they were telling us about how there is like some weird historic connection. Oh, Van Gogh, Sean didn't make me a fan. I was already a fan. I was saying Sean Alexander made my love of college football go through the roof. I was already an Alabama fan before that, but like that was... Let me see if I can remember which season it was where it was just like. It was 99 because I, I remember watching them on VHS. I remember watching them on VHS. You got to remember, I was five years old at the time. But like, I remember even watching it in the 2000s. Um, the VHS. That's like that's how I'd watch college football, and I'd go back and rewatch old games um, on VHS because we had a closet full of VHS tapes of college football games. Like riding horses all day, he wouldn't get done. He'd he'd go out to the barn at uh, sometimes four o'clock in the morning. He wouldn't come back into the house until seven o'clock at night. And uh, at night, we'd rewatch all the college football games on VHS. So I, I actually, it's crazy. After my dad passed, I still I have his old Nebraska gear. I have old VHS tapes of Nebraska and Alabama um, at my house right now, in, in a box with all of his stuff. I really need to get a VHS player. I, I'd really like to get a VHS player and see if those tapes still work. I think it'd be a lot of fun to rewatch them. But neither here nor there. Great conversation today, Undefeated. Great conversation today. Had a lot of fun. Great questions. Great questions. Great interaction. This was a ton of fun. Rewatch them, man. I'm gonna I actually think I might go today and try and find a VHS player, Louie. Because I'd love to rewatch those games. Oh, that's life, man. That's life. But it'd be a lot of fun to rewatch those games. It'd be so much fun. Anyways. Anyways, neither here nor there. Undefeated, y'all have been fantastic. Unfortunately, I am your last morning segment. You lost. I, Louie, that's awful, man. That's awful. I'm so sorry to hear that. A parent should never lose their child. That's awful. It's one thing being a, a child losing a parent, right? Like, that's the natural order of things. But the opposite is far more heartbreaking. And I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. But you already know, ma'am, the undefeated is here for you. You ever need to talk? I'm sure any of these great people in the undefeated would love nothing more than to support one of their own. Remember what I said, guys. When someone falls, we pick them back up. We set the standard. We set the standard. Not on the football field. The football team will set the standard on the football field. That's what they do. We set the standard as fans and as a community and as family for one another. That's the standard we set. And... uh you guys are unbelievable at that. Writing music helps. What kind of music do you write, man? Your real name is Justin. Well, I'm glad you found your piece, man. Or attempting to. But you guys are amazing. Unbelievable supportive. Unbelievable community. And today was such a fun uh, time, guys. The debates, right? That's what this is all about. It's It's meant to feel like we're all sitting at a table talking football and if you've ever sat at a table with your friends talking football you'll know you don't agree on everything and that that always is actually even more fun when you get into the conversations that you don't agree with right like our quarterback list it's always more fun when there are dissenting opinions because then you can really go deep in analysis and it's, it's awesome thank you guys for being truly undefeated thank you guys for being a great community thank you guys for all of the support 
More great content will be coming your way this afternoon from Bama Football on YouTube with Kyle Henderson. Until then, it has been an absolute pleasure and a blessing being here with you all for these previous two hours. Can't wait to see you guys tomorrow. And as always, roll tide.